everyone! You are listening to the Rue Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And we are back for another news episode. This time we're going to be covering scientific stories from August of 2023. Mm-hmm. But before we jump into that, Albert, how you been? Yeah, um, I would say I've been good. Uh, it's been a little while since we last recorded. So let me think. I guess uh, I've been kind of busy, I guess, uh, kind of preparing for various things and just uh, continuing to progress with various research projects. Uh, Probably the biggest event that is worth talking about here um, is that earlier this month, so earlier in September, the um, annual Paleontological Association Conference happened. Um, This is an association that's Uh, primarily composed of European paleontologists, especially British paleontologists. In in a way, it's kind of a counterpart to SVP, which we've mentioned many times on the on the show, um, which is the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, a primarily American based um, society, uh, although people from all over the world attend its annual conference, which is coming up next month. Um, But in any case, uh, the Paleontological Association is kind of different in that not, not only is it more Eurocentric, uh, but also it's not attended by just vertebrate paleontologists, um, but also paleontologists who study all kinds of different paleontological fields, uh, study all kinds of different organisms other than vertebrates. So um, at the um, annual PALAS conference, as we call it for short, um, you get talks on invertebrates as well, and uh, plants, and microscopic fossils and things. So um, it has a very different feel to, to SVP, I think. A couple of interesting things about this year's Palace Conference. Uh, one is that uh, it happened in the city that I'm currently based in now, Cambridge. Um, so uh, actually, my institution was involved with organizing this uh, this conference, and uh, I, I got to help out a little bit as well with the with the setup. And I presented a poster on my research. Uh, it was mostly on a big project that uh, I only kind of finished up most of the work for recently. Um, It's kind of the the last project I have uh, left unpublished from my PhD, so it it went fine. Nothing bad happened. (laughs) But uh, the the thing about Palace is, like like I said earlier, it's um, because it's so broad, at least compared to SVP in terms of the topics covered, uh, there just isn't as high a concentration of people who are like other specialists in in your field uh, when you attended. So I, I feel like... If you present at Palace, the attention that you'll get um, is relatively low compared to if you go to a more specialist uh, conference. Uh, but I, I think it is it is really nice to be able to see presentations on topics that uh, are things that you don't necessarily work on. Not only do you get an idea of what's going on in other fields, but also they they can be really interesting. Like honestly, I. I I think uh, oftentimes I, I'm at a Palace conference and uh, I attend a talk that I, I don't really expect to be especially interested in or invested in. Um, like it, it might be about plankton or, or uh, like it might be about um, the tracks of marine invertebrates or something. And, and you know, I, I, I like zoology, but it's like the, the, those aren't topics that especially catch my eye. Uh, and, and yet... A lot of the time, I sit down one of these talks, and it's like, oh, this is, this is really well presented, and it's actually very, very interesting. So uh, it, it is nice to, to be able to, to do that um, at, at these types of uh, events. So, yeah, uh, Palace was fun. It, um, it, it also takes place over a shorter amount of time than SVP does. Like, like pretty much all the talks um, that happen at Palace uh, occur over the course of about two days or so, whereas with SVP, it can be, like, twice as long as that. So... Palace tends to be, it's it's a relatively big conference, but I also kind of get the feel as a relatively low-key kind of conference. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's probably the biggest uh, thing that's happened to me lately. Um, how about you? Uh, well, I guess I can say that I've had two big life events happen to me this past time. Uh, first of all, uh, I had my bir- I got to celebrate my birthday, hmm. um, which was pretty nice. Uh, I'm now 29, and... Uh, as you say, as you get older, uh, it, it, you don't necessarily feel mm. any different. Yeah, like it's not like I was suddenly a different person when you know, the clock struck twelve or anything like that. Um, although let's just say, like, apparently, I was born at nine p.m. So huh. I guess most of my birthday wasn't technically my birthday. <laughs> so, 
It's more like birth night. Uh, but anywho, that was a very nice celebration. Um, and then like a couple days after that, I had my one year anniversary with my partner, um, mm-hmm. which makes this my longest relationship to date. Which uh, that's that's always a good feeling. Um, but definitely, what was also really exciting was um, so on the twenty third of August. Uh, so about the week after we uh, had our interview with, with Meg, um, our good friend Meg, um, through time and clades turned three years old. <laughs> That's a pretty big accomplishment. Um, obviously, we're trying to save sort of the uh, the big anniversary announcements for like special coverage on our episodes. So, but even the, even so, uh, I think reaching three years has been pretty great. Um, that's quite exciting. Um, I know this past year of, of doing the show has been especially fun. We've been opening more topics. We've been doing a, a greater variety of shows. I mean, we've had a couple of interviews already, mm. um, a couple of special episodes, and uh, there's still more to come. And uh, it's exciting to be able to get to do this with you, buddy, and <laughs> hear all these cool stories with everyone. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's really what I've been kind of up to. Um, but we definitely have some fun uh, announcements for, like, upcoming events. So, uh, uh, Alb, do we want to kind of jump forward? Yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> awesome. So uh, we have a couple, like, announcements for um, natural history media, uh, as well as a follow-up, which uh, I know we rarely do, but when we've covered a topic more than once, it always feels important that we try to get to, like, the present understanding of things. Um, but first things first, yeah, we have some media news. Um, so we have, I believe we've talked about Netflix's upcoming series, uh, Life on Our Planet, uh, or excuse me, Laugh on Our Planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's my terrible Morgan Freeman impression. Um, yes, so we've gotten a lot more information on this series now. Um, we have general synopses, we have how many episodes to expect, and we have an official release date which I think they've actually bumped forward a little bit. Hmm. Um, it was supposed to be the 28th of October, but now it's the 25th of October. Hmm. Um, they're going to drop this whole series on Netflix. Um, they have announced that we are getting eight hour-long episodes. So that is an impressive amount of content. Um, and of course, uh, we've received two trailers so far since the first one. Um, that's kind of revealed much more footage and kind of giving us more of an idea of what the visual style of this series is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been fortunate to get also episode names and descriptors. So we can kind of see how this series is going to be divided up and what we can expect. Um, and right away, I, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that this series seems to be framed with a sort of Battle for Survival theme? Yeah. Um, in conjunction with mass extinctions. So um, it seems that the series, while this is more of a just a general history of life, they do seem to be using the mass extinctions as framing <laughs> devices for the different episodes. Um, which is kind of interesting because, as we've also discussed before, we're also getting another new Paleo series specifically focused on mass extinctions mm. um, for NBC, uh, and that is Surviving Earth. So that's interesting. We're kind of... I hope we don't get too much mass extinction fatigue or <laughs> this is something that's kind of has bigger implications, like as the, um, I know our friend Meg has talked about, you know, are, are we getting climate change anxieties, and that's showing up in all of our paleo media now mm. as we come to terms with the anthropocene event right um good question but yeah basically from what we can tell based on these descriptors and from the footage um they're going to be kind of doing a comparative approach for a lot of the sequences so we're going to be seeing all these different prehistoric animals um but it looks like that they're going to be comparing these to modern day species Mm -hmm. so like they're living relatives slash descendants um which is kind of nice i don't see that approach taken all that much um when it's not in like a behind the scenes approach Um, 
So that'll be interesting to see how they how they jump between that. Because in the trailers, they they'll show like they'll show tyrannosaurs and smilodons and things, but then they'll also show like komodo dragons, right? And yeah. uh, cuttlefish <laughs> and uh, African megafauna. So I'm curious how they're going to try to tie all of these together. Um, I I am hoping our komodo dragon footage is not going to be in conjunction with the non-avian dinosaurs, right? Because like, um, that just brings me back to. That old series, The Most Extreme, which I'm sure many of us grew up with, where they did a prehistoric animals episode. It was like Most Extreme Ancestors, Awesome Ancestors, or something like that. And they put the friggin' Komodo dragon with Tyrannosaurus. Right, dragon. right. No, that's not... That, that, that relationship's not even close. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping they don't make that mistake. Um, but I, I'm trying to be a little bit optimistic. Um, the temporal spread seems interesting um based on what i could gather from the descriptors we're gonna get about two and a half episodes devoted to the pre-cambrian time and the paleozoic era and then there's going to be about two and a half episodes devoted to the mesozoic and then about two episodes for the cenozoic and then the first episode sounds like just a generalized overview of things um so that's i mean it's not bad. Um, I mean, for one thing, we're actually getting Paleozoic content, which uh, goodness knows we've been a little bit starved for that. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really think of any recent Paleo series since, um, I don't know, Animal Armageddon, maybe, Walking with Monsters, that has dedicated more than a couple of hours to Paleozoic species. Mm -hmm. So that'll be an interesting question. Um I'm curious on your thoughts about this, Al. What are you? What are you? What are your impressions now that we're getting more info on life on our planet? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm I'm definitely interested to see it, um, and uh, certainly there have already been a lot of comparisons to prehistoric planet, which uh, I think is kind of inevitable. Um, and I, I mean, you know, to, to be honest, I I can't say I've completely escaped from it myself because prehistoric planet was such a such a big deal in terms of um kind of the paleo media sphere um that you kind of can't help but compare anything coming up um, now or in the future uh to it but it, it does seem that they are taking a kind of fundamentally different approach uh, however uh, it's not super apparent from the trailers that, that we've seen so far like like yeah you do see that they're clearly using a lot more footage of modern wildlife in life on our planet uh but kind of the, the way it's framed like in, in the trailers like they, they just keep showing you all these um all these um scenes of of the animals wh whether they are cgi prehistoric ones or or extant ones um and just kind of applying the whole running narrative of um kind of the, the struggle for existence and, and mass extinctions on that so i feel like a lot of people might go into this thinking that this is going to be very similar to to prehistoric planet and it's, it's just going to be primarily uh, composed of footage of, of these animals um and, and like kind of presented in a typical nature documentary fashion of like showing what these animals are up to uh supposedly in their uh, in their lives and such uh but the the info that we've gotten from like press releases and such paints a slightly different picture. Like obviously there are scenes in here of these animals reconstructed as they, as they might have looked like and might might have interacted with their environments and each other. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be at least a prehistoric stuff is going to be the majority of of the show because uh, I, I think in one of the press releases it was mentioned that only about twenty five to thirty percent of the show was. Uh, going to be composed uh, of these uh, CGI moments. So, in, in fact, I, I suspect it is possible we've already seen a great many of them, um, a great proportion of them in, in these trailers. So I expect that the format uh, is probably going to be a little different, as you kind of alluded to, too, with the uh, suspicion that they're going to do more kind of comparisons with, with modern animals. And, yeah, I think I think that's an approach that can certainly be, be done well. Um, I suppose we'll have to see the final product to really make a... Uh, final verdict on that i'm not a huge fan of the whole framing device at least from what we've seen in promotional material uh, where it's like uh, it's like evolution is this huge battle for dominance or something like that because that just 
is not the case, um, and it's and honestly, it's, it's very very misleading that uh, you, like the the idea that all organisms are trying to become like uh, a certain thing in the process of evolution, and that's uh, that's not not really how evolution works. Um, so it does seem like they're playing that up a little bit, at least in the promotional material, um, a bit too much for my taste. Um, and as for the reconstructions of the animals themselves. Uh, I mean, they, they generally look, I would say, decent. Like in, in terms of like the species that I'm more familiar with, so like the, the birds and, and bird-like dinosaurs, I, there are things I, I could nitpick about them. Um, but, uh, but like the, the reconstructions here are not terrible, I would say. Like they, uh, and they're, they're definitely better than most, most of what has been done uh, in the past. Um, and it, it is really nice that uh, they're covering kind of what seems to be a very broad uh, span of time. And like, like you said, the Paleozoic stuff, uh, that, looks, um, that looks like a really kind of welcome component uh, of the show. Because, uh, yeah, we, we, haven't, we haven't really gotten a lot of Paleozoic uh, attention um, in recent Paleo documentaries. And so, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I have some reservations about how they presented things so far. Uh, but... It should be interesting to watch. <laughs> That's interesting. Wow. So I didn't hear that about the what, 25 or 30 percent CG footage. That's uh, that's surprisingly low. Right. I, um, <laughs> now that, that, is that for the entire series or like per episode? Uh, I would have to check the actual um, quote. If it's per episode, then I'm, I'm starting to get a little heebie-jeebie <laughs> from the alien world. I also um, I'm also reminded of that too. Yeah, so it, it's for for each episode about twenty five percent to thirty percent is the CGI stuff, apparently. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, I'm still I'm still gonna be optimistic. I'll I'll, I'll see what they do with that. Um, oh gosh, that's a yeah. Oh, at the end of the day, I mean, this is new paleo content, and I always welcome it. Mm. And it does look like that there is a lot of care put into the um, right the the recreations of, of the prehistoric animals because um, like, yeah i'm definitely with you on that like just based on what i can see from the models um they look generally pretty good um i know our, our friend ade has talked a little bit about some of the trailer releases for um, life on our planet mm -hmm. and uh, he tended to agree as well uh, barring a, a few minor things um like a what was one that he mentioned? The cave lions. There are cave lions that show up mm. um, in these trailers, and they're kind of like Snow White, right? Like they're, they're kind of doing like an Arctic fox, Arctic hare kind of thing with them, um, which is interesting. But I understand is I guess is a bit of a of a uh, a, a paleo art trope um, because oh, it's an Arctic animal, therefore it has to be like with white fur. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, they look pretty good, um, and. Uh, I'm definitely curious about some of the sequences. Like, uh, I see that we're going to explore um, Pleistocene South America again mm. with uh, uh, Dodecurus and Smilodon and uh, an unidentified terror bird mm -hmm. that they've only con they've only been calling terror bird in, in press releases. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know what species it's supposed to represent. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how they frame that. Um, yeah, that definitely looks good. Uh, definitely interested in uh, seeing how this turns out so uh, that's going to be in about a month um again october 25th on netflix exclusively um so if you have netflix uh you will be able to access all the episodes at once when they drop as for the netflix model um, and so we will see how that goes um and i make sure you look for life on our planet not a life on our planet because that's the david attenborough uh <laughs> movie right um, which is also on netflix as an exclusive <laughs> um, i guess they could have, they could have thought i still think they could have thought a little bit better for the title, but <laughs> too late now <laughs> um so speaking of attenborough projects um so our next announcement um we have gotten some more information on planet earth three so this is now going to make planet earth a trilogy um this was officially announced last month um and like surprisingly soon this is going to come out mm. they're saying later this year right um which is very quick between like an official announcement 
and, and release date. Um, but this is going to get kind of a similar format to Life on Our Planet. Um, so we're getting eight hour-long episodes for this, um, which is longer than Planet Earth 2, which is interesting. Um, I think that one only had six episodes. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of like information about the content, all that we have um, is that the series is apparently going to open with David Attenborough at Downhouse, which was Charles Darwin's home mm -hmm. for the majority of his life. Um, and so he's going to open it there. And uh, based upon other materials, like apparently we have like the book announcement already, which we have part of the of the uh, the cover page shared here. Mm -hmm. um, Planet Earth 3, Our World at the Dawn of a New Age. Um, that is suspicious to me that we're going to be dealing with some more commentary on the Anthropocene event. Um, now, whether they're going to continue the format of each episode is a biome, uh, I don't know. But it is interesting that with the series opening at Down House with some commentary on, on natural selection, um, I, would, I would be interested to see if they change that format to something different. Um, but I guess we'll have to see. Um, Albert, do you have any thoughts about this particular announcement? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely excited for it. Uh, obviously, we don't have much information to go on yet. Uh, but if the previous Planet Earth series have been any guide, you know, I, I think we could expect to see some really, really good material from the BBC once again. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> right. Um, because we're also getting Blue Planet 3. Right. And they have actually gone out and sought out researchers and um, like marine biologists to ask like what sorts of behaviors and footage would you want to see on this series and they might be taking an, a, a, a unique approach this time around to where for some behaviors that maybe are very difficult to film or have not been filmed they might be using cg mm, yeah. to recreate some of these encounters which is certainly different um i still would like to have seen the Blue Planet maybe expand its coverage in the way that Frozen Planet Two did. Yeah, I, I agree. Because uh, it would it would be excellent to see them do like freshwater in environments, for example. Exactly. Yeah, because um, that's I mean that's that's still a part of it. Um, you can show how the freshwater ecosystems are intimately tied with the saltwater ecosystem mm. and how that works, like what nutrient runoff, for example. Um, but uh, I mean, that's what they wanted to do. So I guess we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, but definitely, Planet Earth three. Exciting to see that this series has gotten to this point. Um, I will still call it, like personally, like Planet Earth season three, um, <laughs> because that seems to be the format that they're trying to go with here. Um, but uh, I digress. Um, so that should be later this year. We don't have any official release dates yet, but. I mean, could it be next month? Could it be December? It's a good question. And uh, so that's really it for our media news. Um, I wanted to do a quick shout out before going to our follow ups. So this YouTube channel's been around for a little bit. Um, and But I only had kind of just discovered it within the last couple of weeks. And I have just fallen in love with it. Um, so this is Paleo Edits. This is a YouTube channel. A series of fan edited videos by Carl August W. Um, and they have gone ahead and presented basically a collection of videos that are in several categories. Hmm. Um, so the majority of them seem to be mashups with prehistoric planet footage, um, where they're taking prehistoric planet and they've kind of merged it with other landmark BBC series. Hmm. So, like, there are parodies of Walking with Dinosaurs, and Dynasties, and The Hunt, and Blue Planet 2, where they've taken, like, the audio cues and orchestral cues from those series, and they've kind of mixed in prehistoric planet footage mm -hmm. to make it seem like they're, like, kind of mock trailers <laughs> for series that could be 
so like you know the hunt would be the prehistoric hunt mm -hmm. um or like a perfect planet would be our once perfect planet <laughs> um and like they kind of tied it into like it's once perfect because of the mass extinction event. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there's just a lot of nice editing that's thrown in with that um so they've been doing that as well as um kind of like a simple series of videos where it's the prehistoric planet footage without narration and you're just kind of vibing in nature mm -hmm. in these different environments while the cast of prehistoric planet goes about their usual business and like occasionally he'll splice in like things from planet earth 2 um or seven worlds one planet to kind of make an interesting mix mm -hmm. Um, now, obviously, it's not always going to be, like, 100% accurate in doing this, but I'm willing to kind of let that slide because just the aesthetic presentation is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just fun videos to watch when, like, I need to chill out or, like, I'm, I'm working on an errand and I need something nice in the background. Mm -hmm. um, but some of my absolute favorites of his stuff are the wildlife tributes. Mm, yes. So he's been working on, like, they're kind of like music videos where they'll take like a piece of music and they're all to a certain theme so there was one where it was like the new age of dinosaurs that was the one that cued me into this channel mm. where you know it starts out with the mass extinction and it goes 66 million years later and it's all about the birds right and you know, they're, they're the last surviving dinosaurs and look how amazing they're doing and of course, just the choices of footage for each of the different bird species mm. that are in this is just amazing. And it really is enrapturing because he uses the prehistoric planet theme with the birds. Right. And it just it just swells and it's just majestic and amazing. And I mean, I was hooked immediately after seeing that. Um, so like he's done one on mammals and one on reptiles. And when I say reptiles, like not just the non-avian ones. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was a really great choice. So like he includes footage of birds with the reptiles as well right. because it's it's a monophyletic um, system when you have birds with lizards and snakes it, it, they're all part of the same family hmm. um, and it just fits so well um, and I really love um, he did an evolution time lapse hmm. where he took footage from a bunch of different documentaries and um, I'd seen Melody Sheep do a similar thing hmm. with the total history of the cosmos up to this point. Um, so this is just like with Earth history, um, and this one has no narration like that one does. But just the way that the footage is presented, as with the little timeline kind of going forward more and more in time until it gets to the Phanerozoic, mm -hmm. um, oh, it's just beautifully done. So if you all are looking for really amazing content uh, featuring Historic Planet and other of these amazing BBC series. Uh, please, I highly recommend go checking out Carl August W's Paleo Edits channel. Um, we'll put the link in the description to the, the YouTube page. You know, give him your support because um, he's rather prolific. <laughs> like, it seems like every week or so there's a new video that comes out. So he's just pumping these out, and they're amazing at each time. Mm -hmm. um, really quality work. Um, uh, do you have anything to add about? Paleo I'm sure you've seen many of these too. Yeah, I've seen some of them. Um, I, I don't have too much to say that you haven't already, but I, I will second uh, many of your comments. Um, I, I was also clued into this channel quite recently, and yeah, I, I agree. The work is very impressive, like uh, the editing um, and the uh, just, just the, the video production. The final products are, are very, very cool to see. Um, and I, I, also, I also agree. Um, in that, yeah, the the ones where it's like prehistoric planet um, reframed as one of these other BBC series, um, th those videos are fun. But I, I also especially like um, the uh, the wildlife tributes that, that he's done, and yeah, I think it was also the the bird one that I that was the first one I, I saw, and that that one was extremely well done. I I really enjoyed it. Yes, and I, I also appreciated the fact that, yeah, he, he included uh, bird footage in the reptile one, too, because uh, that, that's right. Uh, you, you can't talk about the success of reptiles without acknowledging that birds are a very successful group of reptiles. Um, so uh, I, I think that was, a, that was an excellent choice as well. I also would highly recommend uh, following this, uh, this channel, and uh, I'm really interested to see what, what other, <laughs> what other um, projects he has in store. <laughs> oh, yeah, and uh, Carl, if you're listening... 
Um, I made this comment in private before, but since you're making these wildlife tributes, um, I have no doubts that you know there could easily be ones with like amphibians and with fish and with insects and maybe other invertebrate groups and, and with plants. Um, and once that gets to that point, it would be amazing if like all of those were edited together into like kind of like a wildlife fantasia, if you will. <laughs> just like you can hang out for an hour with all of this amazing wildlife footage and just go through all of the groups of life on Earth. Um, oh, so I'm just I'm not saying do it, but like I, I'd love to see that. That that would be that would be pretty great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, um, Paleo edits on YouTube. We'll put the link. Please go check it out. It's great. Um, but uh, before we get into our news stories, I will go ahead and talk about this follow-up. If you notice our fluffy friend here <laughs> to the right. Um, so we've brought up the subject of Fuegian dogs a number of times on the show. And there has always been controversy about the true identification of these human companions. So uh, when we first discussed them during our October 2021 news episode, uh, that was in the context of a study regarding the earliest human settlements in the Falkland Islands, uh, which seemed to have been abandoned by the time the Europeans showed up there. Um, and in that episode, we mentioned how it had been speculated that the Wera, or the Falkland Islands wolf, uh, which was fairly tame around the Europeans who documented it, may have been brought by people in a sort of semi-domesticated form. Um, and uh, we had talked about how Fuegian dogs, uh, that is after Tierra del Fuego, um, were brought up as a, a domesticated variety of the Culpio fox, which is um, a relative of the Huera. Um, similarly, during uh, my recent special episode on dog origin and domestication, I had briefly mentioned Fuegian dogs as domestic Culpios as well, uh, as an example of kind of the other sorts of canids that were kept by human beings uh, in the pre-Columbian America. Mm -hmm. um, but these interpretations, it turns out, have been a bit controversial because other researchers have argued that some of these animals, as described, may instead have been specialized domestic dogs and not foxes after all. And so back in July, so this was very recently, um, there was a paper by Etienne M. Jack Sick and Sergio A. Castro, um, where they had decided to settle this controversy as best as they could. Um, they analyzed copious historical records, they scoured the scientific literature, just to see what could be made about the identity of these elusive Fuegian dogs, which uh, today are no more. And the answer, it turns out, seems to kind of vindicate both opposing parties hmm. in this controversy. So, despite the fact that the literature has made reference to a number of different Fuegian dogs, each with distinct and rather confusing names, the authors were able to narrow things down into two animals. So, the actual Fuegian dog was indeed identified as a breed of domestic dog. That's Canis lupus familiaris. Um, that was directly descended from the earliest pre-Columbian breeds that seem to have accompanied the first peoples from Northeast Eurasia. Um, so the Yamana, as well as the Chonos and the Kawaskar peoples were actually in possession of uh, these true dogs, these Fuegian dogs. Um, and so those were not domestic culpios as previously discussed. Um, but the culpio, and so that is uh, like Halipex culpeus, um, that has been identified as a Patagonian dog hmm. in the historical literature that were owned by a number of peoples, including the Selknam uh, nation. Uh, so across Patagonia and into Tierra del Fuego, um, indigenous groups had kept different species of canids as companions, often within the same island groups, um, which is an interesting situation. Um, now, in the case of the Cupios, there was actually a possibility in the literature that maybe these were hybridized with domestic dogs. Mm. Um, but the current evidence, as the authors discovered, seems to make this incredibly slim. Like, 
there's you know a mismatch with like chromosome number for example that would make that extremely unlikely mm-hmm. um but regardless should all of these results come under acceptance you know we can actually now have a less confusing conversation um about the identity of these pre-columbian domesticates and so we have to be careful now when we talk about way dog we're actually referring to true dogs mm-hmm. and when we're talking about the semi-domesticated or domesticated foxes those are patagonian dogs mm-hmm. so that's two distinct species that were both owned by people so hopefully that clears things up a little bit um did you have anything you'd like to add buddy uh not much uh, it is it is great to get this clarification on on this subject um and that does remind me that I, I think um, not too long ago, like within the last few weeks, I do remember seeing a news article on a, a recent record uh, of a, um, a hybrid between a domestic dog and uh, I, I think it was, it was in fact um, uh, one of the South American canids, uh, the Pampas fox, I think it was. Uh, so it is, in fact, theoretically possible, um, apparently, for... Uh, pro- probably for a copio to to be uh, to, to hybridize w- with with uh, with the domestic dog, um, so it turns out that idea is not perhaps not so far fetched. However, uh, um, it doesn't doesn't seem to be uh, supported in, in this particular uh, instance. But yeah, that that was a really interesting bit of um, um, news that that I came across recently. <laughs> oh, interesting. And yeah, again, I mean, a slim possibility is still a possibility. Oh yes, <laughs> I would not be surprised if there's a follow up in time where it's like, well, actually we found evidence of, of, of hybridization um, in like a museum specimen or something. Right, yeah. Um, because a lot of the scientific papers that they reference included like um, skins, for example, mm-hmm. and, and, and um, written descriptions and uh, illustrations like the one seen here to try to understand like what is exactly this animal supposed to be. Right. Um, that's interesting, I'll have to check that out later. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, but that is almost certainly relevant to this. Right. Um, but that's really about it with um, our media coverage and our follow-up. Um, Albert, I do believe you have first dibs on our first August story. That Would seems like so. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's jump ahead to the next slide, and we'll start going into our news stories. <laughs> so um, our first story here um, is a new study that... Uh, greatly clarifies uh, some of the most uh, mysterious aspects of arthropod evolution. So the majority of animals on Earth are arthropods, um, and arthropods include you know, all kinds of animals with uh, exoskeletons and jointed appendages. Um, so things like insects and uh shrimps and crabs and spiders and ticks and mites and millipedes and centipedes Uh, those are all types of arthropods Um, and they represent most animals on earth (laughs) i mean that that's kind of a stock fact that is always brought up when um, people talk about arthropods but i feel like we don't still don't appreciate it enough like when you think of the word animal like if you are an unbiased observer you should really be thinking of an arthropod and not any other kind of animal like for example most people might have might uh, might immediately think of a mammal um, instead um so the kind of interrelationships so the phylogeny the evolutionary interrelationships of arthropods um, has been greatly clarified uh, by genetic studies um, and to a large extent uh, a lot of the classic um, classifications of arthropods based on uh, anatomy have still held up to to scrutiny Um, however one of the biggest uh, advances um, when it when the molecular phylogenies came around was the understanding that insects uh, in fact are actually a type of crustacean now that was something that most people hadn't predicted based on anatomy uh, nowadays the group including insects and all the other crustaceans is usually called pancrustacea and that is the term that is used in this new paper um, but there, there is some discussion to be had about whether pancrustacea is the most appropriate term for, for this group. Um, 
Like, for one thing, uh, some people have pointed out, well, uh, if we found that insects are kind of nested within the other crustaceans, uh, then why don't we just extend the term crustacea to cover all of them and just say insects are a type of crustacean, which is you know some something I, I have done and will will be doing in in this um, in this story. Um, certainly, uh, I, I think that's a very um, reasonable uh, option to take. Um, there there is no need to coin a completely new name just because we didn't know insects were a type of crustacean before. Um, there's also the fact that. The uh, prefix pan uh, is often used uh, in a very specific way when it comes to um, nomenclature um, in this instance. So a pan group uh, usually refers to what we call a, a total group of, of organisms. So like that represents the living um, part of a given lineage, as well as all the extinct groups that are more closely related to that modern group uh, led to uh, anything else alive today. And to use a relatively simple example, um, the modern group of humans, for example, is just one species, right? It's us, Homo sapiens. Uh, there's only one living species of human today, so we would uh, call that living group of humans um, the crown group humans. Uh, so that's a group that only includes us. Um, and in the modern day, our closest living relatives are the chimpanzees. But if we look to the fossil record, there are in fact a large number of forms that are more closely related to us than to chimpanzees. And if you want to find out more about these species, you can check out our series uh, led by Joan, um, Humanity, a Prologue, which is all about the evolution of humans. And we know quite a lot about uh, these extinct forms um, that are closely related to us. Um, so think things like um, Australopithecus um, or Homo erectus, Homo habilis, or things like Neanderthals, uh, which technically do still have a bit of a genetic legacy in us. Um, so all of these... Um, species uh, that are more closely related to us than to chimpanzees, but are now extinct, uh, so they don't belong to our modern living human group, uh, they can be collectively called stem humans, um, and all the stem humans together with us, with us crown group humans, is called the total group of humans, total group humans, and also called the pan group of humans. And so if you say pan-human, uh, you're talking about the entire group containing like us as well as our extinct relatives um, that are more closely related to us than to chimpanzees. And so it would be easy for us to perhaps to confuse the term pan-crustacea used in, in this sense with you know the total group of pan-crustaceans, which is not the same thing. Um, because usually when we're talking about pan-crustacea, we are specifically talking about uh, this living group of all the modern crustaceans um, and not necessarily uh, like explicitly to the total group of crustaceans but there have to have been a total group of crustaceans and so what do we call that like it would be something like pan pan crustacea which is very awkward and so yeah it's like should, should we should we really be using the term pan crustacea for for this group um it's a it's an open question um and not only that but like, even if we don't want to use the old term crustacea for this entire group, um, and we also don't want to use the term pan crustacea for this group, there actually has been an alternative name coined for this group, um, but it's not very popular. It's called a tetraconata, um, the four cones, basically, is what it means, uh, which refers to the structure of the eyes uh, in pan crustaceans. And that, that's certainly another possible name that could be used for this group. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it's like you can keep, keep in mind that uh, it, uh, it is kind of up for debate whether we should be using the term pan crustacea um, here. But uh, it is currently the most popular name for this group. And so um, I, I will try to refer to it when appropriate. Um, but uh, I definitely like in kind of... In informal context, I, I don't have any qualms about saying that uh, insects are a type of crustacean because uh, that is uh, also consistent with the kind of phylogenetic relationships here. And so pan crustacea forms one of the three major groups of the living arthropod um, lineages. Um, so the other two um, are 
the chelicerates, uh, which we've talked about before on the show. So those are the uh, spiders and scorpions and their relatives, um, so arachnids and their kin. Um, and the other major arthropod group are the uh, myriapods, um, which are the centipedes and millipedes and their kin. And uh, we know from these recent genetic studies that um, the myriapods and pan, pan crustaceans are more closely related to each other uh, than to the uh, chelicerates. And in fact, that, that was suspected based on morphology previously as, as well. Um, so that is pretty well sorted out. Um, and the fact that insects are a group within the pan crustaceans is also uh, very well established at this point. But there is still a there's there are still some pretty major uh, questions when it comes to like the interrelationships between the different groups of pan crustaceans, and so that is what this study kind of sought to uh, clarify. Uh, and in some ways, it shouldn't be a surprise that we still have so many big questions about the evolution of this group, because there are over one million two hundred thousand named species of living pan crustaceans, and that is just named species. Um, like new species of pan crustaceans are described. I would, at, at my estimate, like, uh, I mean, I, I don't work on uh, these, uh, these species at the moment, but just in terms of what, I, what I've noticed while looking through scientific journals or news articles, um, new species of pan crustaceans are probably named, like, almost every day, maybe. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, uh, there are so many species of pan crustaceans out there. Um, and again, remember, most animals on Earth are arthropods. And in fact, most arthropods are probably pan crustaceans. Um, so that gives you some perspective on just how difficult it is to study this group. Um, because if you want a complete picture of their evolution, you have to study so many different taxa. And obviously, with our current methods and the time and energy that we put into um, studying this topic, uh, we are nowhere close to reconstructing like the absolute complete phylogeny of pan crustaceans, including like every species ever. Um, but people have still given it a pretty good try uh, in terms of like at least sorting out the major groups. Um, and so what this study wanted to do was to include more species of pan crustaceans than had been uh, included in previous um, research on like the, the major interrelationships between them um, and hopefully clarify how many of these groups are related. And before I dive into those results, uh, I, I'll mention that you know, may, maybe a lot of people don't know this about me, um, but there, I do actually have a personal connection to pan crustacean phylogeny, the, the subject of pan crustacean phylogeny. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why I decided to pick this study as one of my stories uh, for this episode. Um, so first of all, uh, this wasn't something I was involved in, but uh, interestingly, it's kind of some of the early pioneering genetic research that solidified the idea that insects are a type of pan crustacean um, was research that was done at the University of Maryland where I got my bachelor's degree. Um, now, I, I never met any of the researchers who were involved with doing that research, uh, but that was pretty cool. And when I took uh, courses in paleontology and biology, and they would mention that, uh, you know, yeah, uh, insects are a type of pan crustacean, and they would talk about arthropod phylogeny, they would mention that the, a lot of the work uh, that had been um, done demonstrating this was done at our institution. So that, that was pretty neat. Um, Later on, when I did a master's degree at the University of Bristol in paleobiology, um, the thesis project that I worked on was actually on pan crustacean phylogeny. And so the, the project I worked on was to combine not only um, molecular data from living pan crustaceans, but to um, also include uh, morphological data from fossils of pan crustaceans. And we actually have quite a few pan crustacean fossils out there. And to try and you know contribute to resolving this mystery and so it was from there that I learned a lot of techniques in phylogenetics that still uh, helps me in my uh, research to this day. Um, 
now, even though I don't, I, I don't work on Pangos stations anymore, and um, that, that master's thesis that I did was never really published in full. And at this point, if I were to try and publish it, I, I think it would need a lot of updates um, because there has been a lot of new advances in pancreas station, you know, not only genetic phylogeny, but also um, paleontology at this point um, that I haven't really been keeping a close eye on. So uh, I would need to do a lot of work to, to try and get that into publishable shape. Um, but the kind of molecular component of that research uh, was uh, published eventually. Um, so I, I wasn't the lead author handling the genetic data um, on that, but I, 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 would, I did co-author the paper where we presented um, this work, um, where it was like, we have a new genetic data set of pancrustaceans, and here's the phylogeny we got. Like prior to this new study that I'm going to talk about today, uh, we had one of the most recent kind of genetic phylogenies of pancrustaceans. So that, that was a pretty interesting project to be involved in, even if only as a, a minor uh, contributor. Uh, and in fact, that, that was the first um, paper that had my name on it that was ever published. So uh, it does also have that bit of significance uh, to me. So yeah, uh, yeah, just a bit of trivia about why why I decided to pick this, um, this topic. Um, I'll, I'll try to remember to link um, the paper I co-authored uh, in the description below. But uh, yeah, let's see what this new study found. Um, so we're going to walk through this pancrustacean tree, and there are a lot of pancrustaceans, so, so buckle in. Um, so let's start from like the bottom of the tree, like the first divergence within pancrustaceans. This topic is not really um, controversial. Um, pretty much all the recent genetic studies on pancrustacean phylogeny agree that the first split in the modern pancrustaceans um, are between all the other pancrustaceans versus one group called Oligostraca. Um, and the unfortunate thing about Oligostraca uh, when it comes to talking about it is that most people have never heard of any of the members of Oligostraca. Um, but they include some seriously weird pancrustaceans. Um, so they include, um, among others, uh, two groups that are parasitic. Um, so one of these groups are called fish lice, or the Branchiura. And as their name suggests, they live mostly on the bodies of fish, and they feed on the mucus that the fish secrete from their skin, um, or on fish blood. And then there's another group of parasitic pancrustaceans called the tongue worms that are closely related to the fish lice. Um, these are, uh, the technical name for them is the pentastomids. And they live in the respiratory tract of uh, tetrapod vertebrates, so four-limbed vertebrates like us. And in fact, there are records of humans having been infected by these tongue worms. Um, they're called tongue worms not because they live on tongues, uh, but because they kind of look like tongues. In fact, they barely look like crustaceans anymore. They look like weird segmented worms, kind of. Oligostraca also includes a, a group which most people have never heard of as well, um, and that's probably because they are very, very small. Um, they're like a millimeter or smaller, and they mostly live between sand grains on, on beaches um, and other coastal habitats. Um, and so uh, not really easy to observe, and therefore most people don't know about them. They're, they're called um, mystacocarids. Um, and then there's a group called the seed shrimp, or the ostracods. And so these are a group of pancrustaceans that are also very small. Uh, they, they're aquatic. They live in all kinds of aquatic habitats. And they can live as plankton, so floating in the water column or in the sediment at the bottom um, of these water bodies. And their most distinctive feature is that they have uh, like two shells on either side of their bodies that, that protect them. Um, so they, they look a lot like clams in a way. Um, but in, if you look inside their, their shell, you'll see that there's a tiny little creature that looks a bit like a tiny shrimp. Um, and so they're definitely crustaceans. They just have these uh, two uh, clam-like shells surrounding them. Um, and so that's the reason they're called seed shrimp, because they, they you know, look like these tiny seeds. Uh, now, something interesting that was found in this study, as well as some previous studies, um, is that the ostracods may not actually form a clade. So it might not be that all the ostracods are like each other's closest relatives, um, to the exclusion of the other crustaceans. Um, what they found here, and if you have good eyesight, you might be able to pick this out, is that some ostracods might be more closely related to the mystacocarids, um, those uh, tiny, tiny forms that live in the sand grains, or between sand grains, um, than to other ostracods. Um, and this is something that other studies have also found, uh, but it's still a bit controversial. Um, and uh, it is possible that 
if we really want to be confident in this result, uh, we're going to need to um, like study a lot more species of ostracods and other oligostrochans uh, because the number of oligostrochans that they included in this study um, is not a very great number. You can see that they, they only account for a pretty small part of this uh, phylogeny up here. Um, so we, we might need more data to really sort that out, but it is interesting. Um, then we get to the group containing all the other uh, crustaceans. Um, the first group that we'll cover here, uh, let's look at the, um, the group that is more closely related to insects first. Um, so this is a group called Allotriocarida, including the insects and their close relatives. Um, and so there are multiple major groups in here, uh, the most famous of which probably are the hexapods, which are the insects and their immediate kin. Um, so these are the group of um, pan crustaceans with six walking limbs, most of which live on land, um, but they, they have kind of colonized a wide variety of habitats, including aquatic ones. Um, and one of the big questions in pancrustacean phylogeny for the longest time has been, what are the closest living relatives of the hexapods? So, you know, it, we know that the hexapods are a type of pancrustacean, sure, but which pancrustaceans are they most closely related to exactly? And that's been a long-standing controversy um, ever since we discovered, like, this result. Now, a lot of the recent studies, including this one, and as well as the one that I co-authored, uh, have seemed to like settle on an answer. Um, and it seems that the closest living ant relatives to the hexapods are a group called the remipedes, um, which are a very interesting group of crustaceans. So they live in coastal groundwater, so they live in like underground reservoirs of water, um, but in caves, and they are they have very long bodies. Uh, with swimming appendages all along each segment um, of their bodies. And so they, they look a little bit like uh, a swimming centipede, I guess, but they're not closely related to centipedes. Um, centipedes are, are not pan crustaceans, remember? Um, but similar to centipedes, uh, they are venomous, interestingly. Uh, and so they are, they are aquatic predators that inject venom into their prey to capture them. Um, and uh, they seem to be the closest living relatives to the hexapods. Very curious relationship, but that is what most of the evidence seems to indicate. Um, and then there is another group um, that has also been a contender for the closest living relative to um, the hexapods, and those are the branchiopods, uh, which are another aquatic group of crustaceans. Um, and they are a lot more widely distributed than the remipedes, so they're not only found in groundwater, for example, but pretty much any kind of aquatic habitat that you can imagine, but primarily in freshwater, interestingly. Uh, most branchiopods feed primarily on plankton, and so they spend their time swimming around in the water column. Um, others can be more omnivorous, and they'll eat pretty much any kind of organic matter they can find. Um, and a lot of people might not realize this, but they might be familiar with some types of branchiopods. Um, if you've ever kept uh, or heard of sea monkeys, quote unquote, uh, those are actually a type of branchiopod, specifically brine shrimp. Um, there's also um, uh, a group called the triops, uh, which are also a type of branchiopod and, and are sometimes kept as pets in a very similar manner. They can lie dormant. There are these eggs can, um, and then if you pop those in the water, they can hatch. Um, uh, water fleas are another type of branchiopod that people might have heard of, so they are a very diverse group. Um, and then there's a group that, in contrast, pe most people have almost certainly not heard of called the horseshoe shrimp or the cephalocarids. Uh, they have an elongated body like the remipedes do, but a bigger head. Um, and they live mostly in marine sediment and feed on kind of organic material in there. Um, and for a long time, um, people have found uh, a possible relationship where it's like maybe the remipedes and the cephalocarids are closely related and then together they are the, the closest living relatives to the hexapods but recent studies suggest that this is probably not the case um, and in fact this was probably driven by kind of artifacts in the data so it's uh, it's probably not an, an accurate uh, result uh, so that that was in fact one of the one of the kind of takeaway messages of the the paper that i co-authored um back in 2019 um and then uh, here's the big surprise that came with this new study. So this new study added a surprise party member to this kind of group of insect-related crustaceans. Um, and so this group is Lycopipods. 
Copepods are another aquatic group of crustaceans um, that can be found in all kinds of aquatic environments. They're incredibly diverse. Uh, the name uh, copepod means oar feet, and that's because they have a pair of appendages that they use as oars to swim through the water. Um, now, even if you think you've never heard of copepods before, there's a very good chance you've been exposed to them in popular culture. Because the character Plankton in SpongeBob SquarePants the cartoon is actually a copepod, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, so obviously he's a very, very cartoonized copepod, but he still does have some features that real copepods have. So those two long antennae that he has are things that real copepods um, have. And additionally, you know, how he only has a single eye in the center of his body. That is something that a lot of copepods actually have. They only have a single eye. Uh, eye, um, and it's situated kind of uh, along the midline of their body. Now, copepods in previous uh, studies on pancrustacean phylogeny um, were thought to be more closely related to other types of pancrustaceans like um, the crabs and lobsters and such, which we'll talk about next. Um, but uh, this new study uh, found stronger support for the idea that copepods are actually members of this insect-related clade, the Allotriocarida. Um, and so they're kind of a surprise party member here. Now, this is not a completely new result because there have been other studies in the past that have found um, this as well, but it just was not like the leading hypothesis. Like other, other studies, other more recent studies haven't really supported it. But this uh, study kind of brought it back uh, um, and suggests that maybe it might in fact be the most uh, well-supported um, position for, for where copepods go which is very interesting. Uh, in terms of how the uh, major groups of allotriocaridins are related, um, we're relatively confident that the remipedes are close to the hexapods, but the other groups uh, are still a little bit of a mess, and so we're probably going to need more data to sort those out. Um, but uh, let's hop on to the other big group of pancrustaceans. Um, this group has been given the name uh, Communostraca, the uh, common shelled ones. And that's because these pancrustaceans um, tend to have very, very hard outer shells. Uh, their exoskeletons tend to be very, uh, you know, very solid. Um, previous studies have often included the copepods in this group, but again, that's not the case in the results here. Um, in, instead, uh, this group... Um, or this study, um, finds two major groups of uh, communostracans. Uh, one of these um, are the barnacles and their close relatives. Uh, and barnacles are a very curious uh, group of uh, crustaceans. Uh, in fact, if you just look at a barnacle, uh, they look like these rocky things that are attached to bigger rocks. Like They, they don't look like crustaceans at all. Um, but if you look inside the shell of a barnacle, uh, what you'll find is basically a shrimp-like animal that's uh, glued by its head to a surface um, and uses its legs, it sticks its legs out of its shell to kick food into its mouth. And so they're also a mostly kind of plankton feeding group. Um, and so they, they kick like tiny particles from the water column into their shells um, and then feed on those. Um, and that's the way they feed as adults, at least. When they're um, juveniles, when they're larvae, um, they kind of float around in the water column as um, plankton. And uh, there are actually some very curious types of barnacles that have not only stopped looking like crustaceans, but have stopped looking like barnacles um, and are a type of parasite that parasitize other types of crustaceans. They're very curious. Um, yeah, you can look up um, uh, rhizocephalins are the group of barnacles that do this, and they mostly are parasites of other types of crustaceans, uh, such as crabs. Very, very interesting. Um, there are also some other um, close relatives of barnacles that also um, are primarily parasitic groups. Um, so that seems to have been something that this particular lineage has re-evolved many times for some reason. Um, this, um, this study didn't really focus on um, that particular group. Um, so they, they only sampled a relatively small number of uh, barnacle species here. Uh, but there are some mysteries when it comes to their phylogeny as well. Um, but again, not the main focus of the study. Um, instead, this main study mostly shook up the uh, interrelationships between the other big group of communostracans, common-shelled ones, um, the malacostracans. 
and the malacostracans, you can basically think of them as the quote-unquote typical crustaceans, because if you think of the term crustacean, you'll almost certainly be thinking of a malacostracan. Um, and so things like the, uh, the crabs and lobsters and shrimp and prawns are all members of malacostraca. And the phylogeny of malacostraca has been basically a huge mess up to this point. Uh, like, there haven't been that many studies done, done on them uh, in terms of their phylogeny, and uh, the phylogenies that have been generated for them have often had some major disagreements with each other. Uh, but with this new study, with new, um, new data, um, they concluded that probably Malacostrica can be divided into three main groups. Um, so the first group, uh, being the kind of um, closest living relatives to the others, this part is not so controversial. Um, so the first group is called Leptostraca, uh, which is a group that most people have probably never heard of before, a group of marine filter feeding crustaceans with a big kind of shell covering their front end. Um, they're called uh, Leptostracans. Uh, you can see here that there are they are the silhouette in uh, kind of purple color around in the middle of the figure. You can see how the, the front end looks really swollen because they have a big shell covering it. Um, what's more novel about the results of this study was what happened to the other groups of pan, um, uh, malacostricans. Um, so they found that malacostricans can be divided into two other main groups other than the Uh So one is a group that has long been recognized called the pericardans. And this group is super diverse, and uh, in fact, it would probably take a yet another study to figure out like their internal phylogeny. Um, but some of the more kind of notable groups, or these better known groups of um, pericaridans, include the isopods. Um, and even if you've never heard the term isopod before, you might be aware of things like roly polies, also called woodlice, which are a terrestrial group of um, malacostricans. And you might have also seen pictures of like deep sea isopods that are that can grow to very big sizes. They're kind of um, very creatively known as the giant isopods. Um, and so those, those are probably the best known group of pericardans to most people. Um, there's also a very diverse group of uh, aquatic um, uh, pericardans called the amphipods. Well, mostly aquatic, actually. They can also be found on beaches. Uh, things like sand hoppers are actually a type of amphipod. Um, and so they're, they're another uh, very uh, diverse group uh, within the pericarida. Um, pericaridans also includes many other groups, uh, many of which have never been included in a phylogenetic study, not even this one. Um, so uh, yeah, there are definitely more work needed on that end of things. Um, and then a new group that is newly recognized by this study um, is called the stomatocarida. And so the stomatocarida includes uh, first of all, things like mantis shrimps. Uh, mantis shrimps um, have become, you know, pretty well known, I would say, uh, in this day and age, uh, probably, probably because there's been a lot of, like, kind of viral internet posts about them. And they certainly are very remarkable creatures. Um, they are well known uh, for being able to generate incredible amounts of force. Um, so they have, like, these appendages that are um, specialized for uh, disabling their prey. Um, some species are good at basically punching their prey um, into submission, um, or uh, some species instead spear their prey with these appendages, depending on how they're shaped. Um, and in fact, the um, kind of uh, the clubbing appendages of some of these um, mantis shrimps can be so powerful that they can break aquarium glass. So it takes like you know extra thick glass to be able to contain them. Um, they also have very unusual kind of um, adaptations in terms of their vision. Um, they have like a lot of different color receptors in their eye, like between 12 to 16 color receptors. Uh, by comparison, we only have three. Most other mammals have two, and most other vertebrates that aren't mammals have four. Um, whereas, you know, mantis shrimps have many times the, t the color receptors that we do. And there's been this misconception that has arisen from this. Basically, people have, have thought that, oh, well, uh, uh, mantis shrimps have so many more color receptors that they must see like so many more colors than we do. Um, that's not strictly true. Um, they can see ultraviolet, that which we can't. Um, but you know, most vertebrates with four color receptors can also see ultraviolet. So that's you know, in, in that sense, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and in fact, people have done experiments on this. Mantis shrimps are not as good at at distinguishing different types of colors as we are. Uh, funnily enough, so like we can distinguish between like shades of color that are very similar to each other. Um, but mantis shrimps actually 
cannot uh, to the same extent um, when it comes to like distinguishing between similar shades. Um, so the extra large number of color receptors that they have is probably not to do with seeing a massive amount of different colors. Uh, there are This is still a topic that's being studied, but one idea is that maybe these large number of color receptors help them recognize colors faster than we can um, and um, allow them to react accordingly, um, depending on what, what they want to do. Um, so that seems like a more likely reason for why they have so many color receptors than what most people might imagine. Um, the stomatocarids also include the decapods, which are, again, the uh, kind of the, the famous core group of malacostricans. Um, now, uh, if you've seen Moana, you might be familiar with the term decapod because it's included in the lyrics of the song Shiny, sung by the, the giant um, uh, antagonistic crab, uh, Tamatoa. Um, and so if you remember that song, you might remember the term decapod. He refers to himself as a decapod, which is true. Uh, decapods include the crabs. Um, so they, they include crabs, lobsters, shrimp, prawns, like most of the crustaceans that we tend to eat. Um, they also include krill, which look a lot like shrimp, but aren't shrimp. Um, um, and so the decapods are probably the best known group of malacostricans. And specifically, uh, them being closely related to the mantis shrimps is actually something new. Like, e even though mantis shrimps are called mantis shrimps, um, they aren't a type of true shrimp. And in fact, uh, it has been unclear whether they are actually closely related to the malacostricans, but this study suggests, yes, they are. Um, and probably most significantly, but also kind of uh, most uh, obscure in, in terms of the findings of the study, um, is that this study was able to place two groups of malacostricans that are highly mysterious and poorly studied and most people have never heard of. Um, and in fact, I, I was not really familiar with either of these two groups uh, before I read the study. Um, so one of these groups is called the Anaspidaceans. They are mostly found in Australasia, although some are found in South America as well. Um, and it's, they are especially diverse in Tasmania, uh, interestingly enough. Most of them live in caves, and so that's probably why they haven't been very well studied. Um, and the other group is called Bathynelacea, um, the Bathynelaceans. And uh, they are more widespread, but they live between sediment in groundwater. And so again, that's probably why they haven't been very well studied. They're hard to get to. Um, and they're another group of crustaceans that are vaguely worm-like. They're not quite as worm-like as the tongue worms are. They still have legs. They have very short legs. Um, but again, they're very curious looking crustaceans. And traditionally, it has been thought that these two obscure groups of malacostricans um, are each other's closest living relatives. So uh, they used to be united in a group called Syncarida. Uh, but this study suggests that this is not the correct way to classify them. Um, because what they found was that the Anaspidaceans uh, might instead be more closely related to the krill. Um, so they are the closest living relatives to krill. Um, whereas the Bathynelaceans are not um, closely related to the Anaspidaceans, but instead kind of closely related to a group containing the krill, um, Anaspidaceans, and the decapods all together. Um, and so they are actually relatively widely separated from each other in malacostrican um, uh, phylogeny. And so uh, we probably shouldn't be using the term syncarida uh, for these two groups anymore at least according to these results. Uh, that being said, they were only able to sample one species from both of these groups. Um, and so, you know, once again, more data needed um, if we really want to clarify uh, the, the situation here. But it is a, it is very cool that they were actually able to include uh, these, these groups. Um, okay, so we, we've, we finished our, our walkthrough of the crustacean tree finally. Um, so one thing that they found is that they sampled a larger number of species from many of these groups than previous studies have. And it turns out that they found that this makes a big difference in the phylogeny that they found. Um, it turns out when, when they removed a lot of these extra species, they found like a very different tree when it comes to some of these relationships. Um, for example, they found like that old uh, result I mentioned earlier, the remipedes being close to the cephalocaridins, which we're pretty sure is not a, not a real grouping anymore. And so when they added these these uh, new extra species, um, they found a different uh, result, um, suggesting that, yeah, sometimes it matters, like what species you include in your analysis. Um, 
and sometimes that can make all the difference in getting your accurate uh, results. Um, and that makes some sense, right? Because like studying these phylogenies is a lot like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, but you don't have the box to see what the final art looks like. Um, so you can think of like each species as kind of its own puzzle piece, basically. And so the more puzzle pieces that you have in your analysis, like the more complete picture you can get of what their phylogeny looks like. And sometimes you might have like these two pieces that seem like they go, they go together. Uh, if you just look at their kind of actual, um, you know, illustration on them or like their shape. Uh, but when you have more puzzle pieces, uh, you find that, oh, actually, they, they might actually be uh, quite uh, uh, distantly uh, spread apart. Um, and so uh, it, it can be very important for us to like sample as many species as we can when we're doing these phylogenies. Um, also, uh, using this phylogeny, they were able to do like divergence time estimates. So uh, when did these groups uh, split from each other in time based on like estimated uh, rates of genetic mutation? And um, their main results placed the origin of pan crustacea in the Idiacaran, so like well over 500 million years ago. Um, this is an interesting result um, because it is older than not just the oldest known pan crustacean fossils, but also the oldest known arthropod fossils. And it is a real possibility that we just haven't found these old uh, arthropod fossils from this time, and yet they were already around. Um, however, the authors also raise the point that when they apply a different model of uh, genetic mutation, when it comes to like the rates of genetic mutation to their analyses, they found younger estimates for the origin of pan crustacea. Like it could well have been sometime in the Cambrian, which would be more uh, in line with um, the fossil record. And so we, we've kind of touched on this in the, in the show before when we're talking about the origins of birds, for example, or the origins of uh, placental mammals. Um, but there are a lot of factors that can influence the results of your divergence time analyses. Um, and so uh, this is another demonstration of that. Um, and it can be very difficult sometimes to determine like which is really the most appropriate model to use. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think uh, definitely future studies will probably refine uh, these divergence time estimates a lot more um, and help us pinpoint exactly when pan crustaceans originated. But um, like regardless of that controversy, I, I think uh, this is a really impressive step forward in terms of understanding um, the phylogeny of pan crustaceans, and it's really cool that they were actually able to clarify a lot of these the positions of a lot of these obscure uh, groups that have been very controversial in the past. Um, okay, so uh, that that took a little bit, but um, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm happy to see the study for sure. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with the pan crustacean kind of family tree because. I mean, it's one of those recent findings in biology in general that's always interested me, the idea right. that insects are a type of crustacean um, and, and how the topology of the tree is. Um, so I've seen a number of like papers like this over the years that have been kind of slowly chipping away at this. So it's neat to see a newer study that includes more taxa and seems to clarify a couple things as well. Um, I'm immediately curious about this ostracod uh, result. Mm. Um, if the mice took because it looks like, yeah, there's my mydocopa, so that's one of the ostracod groups allies with the um, mysocarids, right? And then the other group seems to ally with the uh, the fish lice, right? Um, so of course, there are some interesting implications with that to mean that the kind of classic ostracod body plan evolved twice, right? Um, in this lineage. Which would be interesting, or is it like? Is there something else going on? Or like the mystocaridids, like were they more ostracod-like once right. upon a time? Mm -hmm. and they just kind of changed as they became very specialized, mm -hmm. as they seem to be. Um, I definitely have lots of questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, seeing copepods with the um, insects and branchiopods is interesting because, I mean, growing up in all the animal books I used to read, um, there was a group called Maxillopoda that was taken to be as like one of the big groups of crustaceans and that was supposed to have the um barnacles and copepods right um, and a couple other similar groups um so it's kind of interesting to see like that group has just is just gone hmm. like mm -hmm. with, with these studies like it's really split it up and, and, and kind of thrown its members all over the place right um 
So like that's still something that I'm kind of have to keep in my head. Like it, it's like maxillopoda. It's like the um, the insectivora of the crustaceans. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like it, that's a name that has no place anymore in in, in phylogeny. Um, but it's interesting. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, because I remember, and of course I I cannot recall the author name or when this paper came out. But there was an interesting study that looked at the relationships between like hexapods, rempedes, um and branchiopods, um, and kind of gave an, an idea of, of like, you know, what could the ecological shifts look like right. as these lineages branched apart from each other. And so it seemed to imply that like, maybe there was like a coastal marine or estuarine origin for that common ancestor. Mm, yes. And so like the branchiopods stayed mainly aquatic, um, the remipedes moved into their specialized group, and then the hexapods just kind of slowly came out of the water um, and became a primarily land-based group. Because, of course, the early um, the early diverging groups of hexapods, these, like, springtails, um, they tend to be found in, like, moist environments. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, I was very familiar with the um, uh, Podura aquata, the Podura aquatica, which was a type of springtail that they usually would congregate after the rains. Mm. I, I have very specific memories of this. Like we'd be out for lunch in middle school, and after after a rain, and all the puddles that would accumulate by like the little patio areas where we would eat, and you would just see like this mass of like wiggling, jumping things <laughs> right. that's like kind of like a slate blue, and it's like what the mm. hell is that? Wow. Turns out those were all springtails accumulating together. Um, and like we would take some, like look at them under a microscope in the biology classroom, and uh, that be, kind of became like my poster child for like what a springtail is like because mm. I was just so familiar with these. Right. And like they are cute little animals, mm. surprisingly. Yeah. Like their their exoskeleton is very soft and pudgy, and they have like these little eyes and like little tiny pudgy antennae that stick out. Um, they, they look like beans, like living beans. <laughs> yeah, it's right, right. Yeah. Um, or like gummy bears. <laughs> yes. They, they don't look like they should be real, mm. but they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's right. And, uh, but uh, I digress, of course. Um, so, seeing this study include copepods now, um, I'm curious, like, how that model would shift now. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And part of me seems to think maybe not very much mm. because there are freshwater and saltwater copepods mm -hmm. um, so there could be some so like that that basic model could probably still hold um but i thought that was very interesting um i mean i, I always appreciate seeing these new phylogenies and i hope that we get further studies that include more organisms maybe more ostracods mm -hmm. and um and some of these other groups and, and they can really see whether these relationships will remain more or less permanent in the literature right not. yeah so uh, yeah i appreciated this and um i'm kind of looking forward to seeing more about it <laughs> but i guess on that note um i'll just add anything else you wanted to add about this paper um we can move on to my first story yeah go ahead <laughs> all right and so we're gonna shift things over from one aquatic realm to another <laughs> um so uh, my first story is a paper by Diego Safian and colleagues. And this touches on a group of animals that we haven't really discussed, but you know should be very familiar to some of our viewers. Um, and I'm referring to the members of a clade called Phocilidae, which includes a number of popular freshwater aquarium fishes. So everybody has heard of guppies, for example. That's a Fossilia reticulata. Um, of course, what a guppy is like the archetypical tiny fish. Like, what, what's a tiny fish? A guppy. Um, but you know, there's also other members of that particular genus that are called mollies. Um, and then there's another genus called uh, Ziphophorus, which include the Pleiades and the Swordtails. So if you go to any like pet shop um, that sells fish, you are almost certain to see many of these represented there. Um, they're apparently very easy to care for, very good beginner fish. Um, they are all primarily tropical American species. Um, but because people are people, uh, they've been released into freshwater systems 
all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, but what is particularly interesting about these fishes and relevant to our, our news story is that all but one of the members of this clade, Ocilidae, are live bearing. They give birth to tiny babies mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. capable of swimming about just after birth. So the eggs are internally fertilized and the embryos develop inside the female's body. And it's within this range, however, that we find some notable variation. So while the majority of ocillids, uh, which we're going to call live bears for the majority of this story, um, they will use yolk to nurture their embryos. Other species have actually evolved a sort of placenta. So just like most mammals today, the placental mammals, um, this placenta is a specialized bag that provides further support from the female to the embryo, whether that would be giving nutrients, aka food, or removing waste products. And so research has shown that the common ancestor of the live bearers lacked a placenta. So this would be a derived trait among these fishes. But here's where things get super interesting because the placenta was not a singular derived trait. It has evolved at least nine separate times within this clade. Hmm. They show up once in four separate genera, twice in one genus, and that happens to be Fossilia, which is the guppies and mollies, um, and then three times in another genus. Hmm. So as Safian and colleagues ask, and to quote the paper, despite important efforts, devoted to understanding why and how the placenta evolved repeatedly in this family, it is still unclear whether the independent evolutionary origins led to organs with similar morphological phenotypes and genomic signatures, resulting from similar evolutionary modification to the development and molecular pathways. So, in other words, when the placentas of these fish are examined, will they be more similar to each other in form and function or will each of these convergent placentas be different in their own way and so to do this the team studied the placentas of just eight species within four genera um, and both the physical at both the physical and molecular levels so uh, among the placentas of the live bearing fishes studied the team were able to find just two morphological types that are represented. And they all share features, of course. So they have a, a maternal follicular wall, which surrounds the embryo and acts as a sort of transport system of blood cell nutrients to the embryo's developing tissues. And they also share uh, what's called a yolk pericardial sac, which is important for heart development. But otherwise, the structures of these placentas um, were different between the two types. Hmm. And so if you see this illustration below, uh, I'll explain further what this means. So if you can tell on the left, that is a villus placenta. So here the maternal follicular wall is studded within by a series of fibrous structures that support a thinner layer of mesothelium tissue around the embryo. Uh, the mesothelium derives from the term mesoderm, meaning that it contributes to the development of the skeleton and muscles, including the heart. And on the right is the smooth placenta. And this morphology is almost analogous to that of the villus placenta. So instead of fiber structures, the maternal follicular wall is quite smooth, while the, mall, while the walls of the mesothelium are much thicker and are supported by more blood vessels. And these differences seem to be confirmed when their direct measurements are correlated to the standard length of the females of each species. So next, the team found that these differences in placental morphology were associated with evolution acting on the maternal architecture of the placentas, so not with the embryos themselves. And it was shown that this evolutionary action on the placentas was related to genes associated with blood vessel formation and regulation of endothelial cells, which help control blood flow. Specifically, there was accelerated evolution in live bears with the villus placenta morphology 
than with the smooth morphology, which, to quote the paper again, shows that not more genes than expected by chance evolve faster in species with a smooth placenta than in species with a villous placenta. And in the grander scale of live bear life histories, the authors noted how the differences in placental morphology impact the further development of the young. So fish stemming from villous placentas grow larger than those from smooth placentas, with the females in particular showing significant differences between the two sexes. Hmm. And those with villous placentas live birthed fewer numbers of offspring than those with smooth placentas when accounting for female standard length. Uh, but otherwise, um, there were really no significant differences in embryo count noted. That's an interesting result. So even accounting for this division into two placenta types, were there indeed more similarities within these two groups than not? So were all of the fish with villous placentas more similar to each other, or were they all different? Um, well, on the whole, yes, they were all similar. But even so, there were very slight differences in the morphology uh, between all of the villous and smooth placenta types. So, uh, for example, among the former, uh, the fibrous structures do show slight differences in length between species. And that gives a, a possibility that perhaps maybe the competence of function may vary between different fish. Um, in contrast, the yolk pericardial sacs were all found to be consistently similar between all the fish studied, meaning that this feature is of the utmost importance in maternal provisioning in all of the live bearing fishes that were studied. Hmm. And so this is on a morphological scale, uh, but as we've seen on a molecular scale, there was evidence of accelerated evolution in genes associated with blood vessel development with differences between the villus and smooth centers. So this amounts essentially to evidence of repeated convergence and divergence together in traits within the evolution of this single lineage, this case being the live bearing fishes or fossilidae. And so, and I managed to look this up, while molecular studies indicate that these fishes had been on the world stage for over 50 million years, their varied placentas actually only began to evolve between a period of 2.3 million years ago huh and 750,000 years ago, wow. which is very interesting. This suggests that this clade shows a very remarkable flexibility within fast evolutionary rates of change. Given their widespread diversity today, so there are over 300 species of live bears, and now that they have more or less a worldwide distribution, so they've been introduced beyond the tropics as far north as Alberta, Canada, <laughs> I have a feeling that the live bears may have a long future ahead of them. But I thought it was pretty interesting to see how there wasn't really like a sharp dichotomy between like convergence and divergence hmm. um, between these different placenta types that how it was kind of like a mix of the two to create these different morphologies. And even so, like with the similarities being the same across many different species. Right. Um, that really caught my attention for this paper. And so I just had to talk about it. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I, I am definitely familiar with some types of these live bearers. Um, cause when, when I was growing up, uh, my family, uh, sp spent a fair, fair amount of time, uh, keeping, um, aquarium fish and among those fishes, uh, would be guppies. And I can certainly attest to the fact that they are very easy to care for. And they also breed very readily. Um, and they do indeed give live birth. Now, you, you do have to be careful uh, when breeding guppies. Uh, and, and like in, in all of these cases, we, we never intentionally set out to breed guppies. They, they just went and did their own thing on, on their own living in the aquarium. Um, but um, if they're in too confined of a space, uh, oftentimes the young, the newly uh, born young, uh, will end up being eaten by, by the adult guppies. Um, but if there's sufficient space for them to like, you know, uh, swim around and, uh, and avoid the adults, um, then that's usually not an issue. And so we kept many generations of guppies like, over the years. Um, 
just con continuously breeding. Um, so yeah, this this is definitely a group of fishes that I was familiar with, and uh, their reproductive behaviors uh, or at least uh, method is also something I, I knew about. Uh, but yeah, I I was not really um, attuned to the fact that they had evolved. Uh, a placenta so many times or like the differences in the structure um, of, of their placenta um, so that this is definitely an incredibly interesting study to me and this type of phenomenon is is always really interesting um, when you have a group of closely related species uh, just kind of re-evolving the, the same adaptation in, in parallel uh, to each other over and over again multiple times um, like uh, a very similar example can be seen in the squamates, so lizards, including snakes, um, for example. Um, like live bearing has also evolved numerous times in the squamates, uh, like something on the order of a hundred times um, from, from what I've heard. Um, and so uh, it, it is always fascinating to study these systems. It's like, why have they evolved this so many times? And is there anything about these groups that allows them to like, uh, or like predisposes them to to evolving like these particular adaptations. So it's al it's always really cool to get um, uh, more insight into this particular topic. I think, um, and this study certainly does that very well. And I, I agree with you. It is it is interesting to see um, where they have similarities and where they have uh, differences. So it's like hmm, like you know, are are some of these similarities slash differences are they adaptive? Um, is there, is there a specific adaptive reason for why they are the way they are? Um, or are, are they sometimes a result of constraints where like they just, it's just easier for them to evolve this way? I, I think I, that can be hard to say, but uh, certainly this, um, this study opens up um, the um, you know, room to, to investigate the, these questions. So uh, I think this was a really interesting study to pick. Uh, thanks for sharing. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. And you bring up a very good point because the authors do state that even in this analysis, like there was still plenty of room for further analysis um, and, and hypothesis testing. And certainly when it comes to like the deep time aspect of this, that's what really caught my attention the most. Right. You know, when I looked up, because in the paper they stated like, you know, again, like these placentas had evolved within the last, you know, two and a half million years or so. And so I'm like, okay. Well, then how old is the group right and then to find all the different papers um showing 50 million years <laughs> plus it's like what the hell are i doing all this time like and like why suddenly in that little window of time in all of these different lineages do we see these placenta types just kind of emerging at a, about the same time it's a uh, it's very interesting i mean i know like from what i could read about like the deep time of these fish is like they underwent some serious dispersals in the past to get to their current distributions. Right. Um, but seeing like that sensible time kind of converge a little bit <laughs> with like the quaternary period, right? Like the, the glacial period, right. like, like I'm curious if that has anything to do with it because uh, again, these fishes are primarily tropical American mm, yeah. um, <laughs> in their natural like distributions, like that they've done themselves. Um, like they can be found as far north as like, you know, southwestern U.S. Right. Um, and then down across the Caribbean and Mesoamerica into northern South America. So, like, they're kind of, they're kind of, like, there. Like, that's where these fish live, um, which, of course, is quite a ways away from, like, any glacials. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that for fish that are so familiar to us, um, there's still a lot of mysteries that, are worth investigating, um, which is no doubt a theme that we've explored many times in this show. You know, familiar animals from across um, the tree of life. You know, from bees and chickens and elephants. Mm -hmm. Like, there's always there's always things that we don't know yeah. mm -hmm. that we still don't know about these animals that we spend every day with. Right. So it's always neat to see them become more familiarized to us, thanks to studies like this. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, uh, so that's all I really had to say about this paper. Um, would you like to go ahead to your second story? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> all right, then. So, uh, on to my second and final story for the episode. Uh, we are going to talk about 
uh, more about animal reproduction, but this time in a group of animals uh, that laid eggs. Um, and I use the past tense here because we're going to talk about an extinct group of animals for this story. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this is one of those uh, in character picks I I, I selected because <laughs> um, we're going to talk about a group of um, uh, dinosaurs that is closely related to birds. Uh, so definitely. Uh, well within kind of my uh, main topic of interest. Um, and in particular, this group of dinosaurs is called the oviraptorids. So uh, the oviraptorids, like birds, are a group of feathered theropod dinosaurs, um, and they are primarily known from the Cretaceous. In fact, the oviraptorids proper are, are only known from the Cretaceous so far. Um, and uh, they are known for a number of things, um, but most famously, uh, perhaps, is that they have been found associated with the eggs. And, uh, in fact, this was what gave them their name. So, oviraptorid means egg thief. Uh, but, as is probably relatively well known now, uh, that turned out to be a bit of a misnomer. Um, now, oviraptorids, uh, most of them were not very big. Uh, many of them were around the same size as a turkey, some of them were smaller, um, but they could get bigger. Um, like, some of the bigger ones get into the range of, like, emu size or ostrich size, and, uh, in fact, we know the very biggest ones, um, probably got very, very big indeed. Uh, so the largest, uh, oviraptorid, well, okay. It, it might be a non-oviraptorid oviraptorosaur, so a close relative, but not, not quite. But it, it is relevant to, to this story, uh, so we'll, we'll include it. Um, so the largest oviraptorid, or close relative, um, that has been named is Gigantoraptor from the late Cretaceous of China. And that was a very big um, for, for, a, um, for an oviraptorid. Um, so that was a large theropod, like over a ton um, in, in body mass. Um, and we have evidence of other large oviraptorosaurs um, living in uh, various regions in the in the Lake Cretaceous because we have found eggs of them um, that, that that they laid. Um, and so that brings us back to those to those nests. So when oviraptor, which gave the group its name, was first discovered, it was found on top of a nest of eggs. And the assumption then was that oh, it was in the middle of feeding on these eggs or stealing these eggs uh, from another dinosaur. And so it was given the name Egg Thief and proposed to be a kind of uh, primarily um, egg-eating dinosaur. Um, and that was the way it was depicted in many traditional uh, media. L later, like other examples of similar nests were found. And it turns out that in a lot of these eggs uh, were preserved embryos of the babies inside. And it turns out that these babies were baby oviraptorids and not of other types of dinosaurs. And so a new hypothesis arose from this. Um, that was the fact that maybe these oviraptorids, um, and since the original oviraptor specimen, uh, other examples have been found of like adult oviraptorids found preserved on top of these nests. Um, and so we found so many examples of these. It was like, the, these are not just chance um, uh, associations between these dinosaurs and these nests, like probably they were doing something on top of the ne these nests for some reason um, on a regular basis. And so the popular interpretation um, has been that they were sitting on top of these nests and incubating their eggs like a modern bird would using their body heat. And oviraptorids were uh, very bird-like. Uh, we know they had feathers, uh, and in fact Many of them, again, were like all but the biggest ones were within the size range of modern birds. Um, and in fact, oviraptorids did not have any teeth. Um, so they also had beaks kind of similar to, to modern birds. Um, now, in fact, if you imagine like uh, a turkey with the head of a parrot, that probably would have been pretty similar to, to what a lot of oviraptorids looked like. Uh, it's very easy to imagine them adopting this very bird-like behavior, especially uh, since we seem to have uh, this very strong evidence that they did this. Uh, we have these individuals preserved directly sitting on top of the nest. Uh, so that seems like a pretty open and shut case, right? Um, 
And indeed, I suspect if you don't actually follow the uh, scientific literature on extinct dinosaurs, um, you might not be aware that there is any kind of controversy about this topic at all, uh, because this is by far the most uh, popularly presented uh, interpretation for why we find oviraptors associated with these nests. Um, Indeed, uh, like if you watch Prehistoric Planet Season 2, for example, uh, there is a segment in there of a group of oviraptorids, uh, specifically the genus Corythoraptor, uh, nesting, and they are shown like sitting on top of their nest to incubate them. But uh, despite the popularity of this hypothesis, it has not gone without question, interestingly enough. There's been quite a bit of back and forth discussion uh, about this topic in the scientific literature. So one of the early objections to the idea that um, oviraptorids were incubating their nests when they were preserved in this way um, was that uh, maybe the eggs were actually completely buried and so they were not exposed to the adult um, while the adult was sitting on top of the nest. So maybe the adult was just sitting on top of a buried a clutch of eggs and perhaps it was just sitting there to protect them maybe it was just resting there after it finished building the nest or something the reasoning for suggesting this argument uh, was that uh, when some people examined the uh, porosity of the eggshells of oviraptorids um, so these hard-shelled eggs like like they are in a modern bird um, have little pores on them to allow the embryo to breathe while it's developing um, and it is possible to determine uh, from the density of the pores uh, whether uh, an egg, a hard-shelled egg, was buried or exposed to air, I guess, you can, that, that's how you can think of it. Um, basically, in general, um, eggs that are buried will have a denser uh, distribution of pores, which kind of makes sense because you probably need a greater density of pores to be able to continue breathing while you're like buried under tons of material like soil or, or decaying vegetation, which is often the case in animals that bury their eggs. Um, whereas if they're exposed to air, then they have a much more direct contact with fresh oxygen, right? And so they need fewer pores. Um, however, it turns out that some of these early studies were flawed uh, because uh, they mostly based their calculations of eggshell porosity of oviraptorid eggs on fragments of eggshell. So they only were able to look at like part of the egg. Um, and it turns out when you calculate eggshell porosity or examine eggshell porosity from complete oviraptorid eggs, uh, you get a quite a different pattern. Um, basically, it turns out that eggshell density is not consistent over an entire oviraptorid egg. There's a part of the egg where there's denser distribution of pores and part of the egg where there's a less dense distribution of pores. Um, and the reason for this, it seems, is that oviraptorid eggs were not fully buried, uh, but they may have been partly buried. And you can kind of see this in the, in the image here. Um, they're kind of situated with one end of the egg uh, buried in the ground, but the other end exposed to open air. So they had partially buried eggs. And this is uh, also supported by other lines of evidence from the pigmentation of their eggshells, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so basically, there are chemical signatures remaining on these fossil eggshells that suggest that oviraptorid eggs uh, had uh, color, <laughs> like they, they weren't just plain white. Uh, so uh, in fact, the oviraptorid eggs that have been examined in this way seem to have chemical signatures that suggest they were colored kind of blue-green, which is quite interesting. Uh, this is the kind of color that we find in various types of birds today, um, particularly in things like emus and cassowaries, uh, these large ground birds. Um, and this is interesting because we basically only see these types of intricate color patterns in animals that they hard-shelled eggs today that don't bury their eggs, at least not completely. Uh, because if these eggs are completely buried, well, what is the point of having color patterns on them, right? Like, uh, most of the time having color patterns on eggs um, is to either camouflage them, meaning that the eggs are exposed, um, or in the case of things like the emus and cassowaries, um, it might be a sort of social signal, interestingly. Um, so uh, the way that these birds breed, oftentimes, is that um, a male will mate with many females and then all of them lay eggs in his nest and then he takes care of the eggs. Um, and so it might be that having a bunch of eggs, um, a bunch of these uh, kind of 
blue-green eggs together. Uh, it's sort of a signal to the female, like, hey, there's a here's a nest over here, and uh, there are a lot of eggs in there, and the more eggs there are, the less likely your eggs are to be picked off by a predator, right? Um, so uh, that can, can be a sort of, like, attracting signal to, to the female. Um, and so, you know, keep, keep that in mind. That might be something uh, we might have parallels to with, uh, with the oviraptorids here. So we have different lines of evidence, like the eggshell porosity and the pigmentation that suggests that Okay, oviraptorid eggs were definitely not completely buried in the sediment, so they were partly exposed uh, to air, and so that does open up the possibility that they were uh, being incubated by a parent. Uh, but further arguments were then put forward, kind of arguing against this as well. Uh, so one idea that was not so much advanced for oviraptorids specifically, um, but for much smaller Mesozoic dinosaurs, like um, various different kinds of Mesozoic avialans, that's a group that includes modern birds and their immediate relatives, um, it was suggested that based on the estimated egg size of Mesozoic avialans, um, that they could not directly sit on top of their nests, um, on top of their eggs, without crushing them. And so people have argued that, oh, maybe Mesozoic avialans, most of them, um, did not incubate their eggs by directly sitting on them, unlike modern birds. Um, but here, it seems that oviraptorids um, were doing something uh, to specifically accommodate this. Because, uh, of course, if this was a problem for the Mesozoic avialans, a lot of oviraptorids were much bigger than Mesozoic avialans, or most of them. So um, they must have had some way to deal with this if they were incubating their eggs. And there is evidence of this. So in oviraptorid nests, at the center of a nest, um, it turns out that with increasing uh, body size of the oviraptorid, there's a trend. So in smaller oviraptorids, and you can estimate this based on the size of the eggs, um, there isn't really a space in the center of the nest for the parent to sit. But if once you get to bigger and bigger body sizes, you find a bigger and bigger space in the center for the parent. Um, and so there's like a specific uh, location here uh, for the parent to sit in the nest, um, and it's been suggested that this was to accommodate kind of increasing body size, allowing even really big oviraptorids to be able to incubate uh, their eggs. And not only that, but um, it has been shown, it has been, it has been pointed out that uh, if you estimate like the kind of the weight, the amount of weight that a single egg can take, it can be a little misleading, uh, because if there's a whole clutch of eggs uh, kind of distributing the weight together, uh, they can take a much greater weight than a single egg would, would be able to. Uh, it's like lying on a bed of needles. Um, like if it's just a single needle, you're just gonna, it's gonna penetrate you. But if it's a bunch of needles all together, then they can support the weight of a person. Um, and so it seems quite probable, at least to me, that uh, the, the idea that a lot of these Mesozoic dinosaurs were too big to incubate their own nests uh, is a little bit misleading if we're based, basing it on the estimated strength of the eggshell, because um, there were a bunch of eggs in a single nest, and so we can't kind of uh, base that conclusion on just what a single egg can take. Uh, it seems that the nest architecture of oviraptorids uh, was specifically kind of arranged to accommodate an incubating adult, but then other people have argued uh, that, wait a minute, the nest architecture in oviraptorids is actually kind of weird, and it's not something that we see in modern birds today. Um, and it seems that some of it, these characteristics that they have would prevent them from being able to incubate the eggs efficiently by body heat. And so to be very specific, um, as mentioned earlier, these eggs are partly embedded in uh, sediment. Um, and that's not something that most modern birds do. Most modern birds, the eggs are completely exposed to the surface. And so it has been suggested that, you know, part, having part of the egg under the ground seems like it wouldn't be a very efficient way for the parent to incubate them. And not only that, but look at how this, um, this nest is arranged. So if you look at the, the, uh, the top image in the middle, um, the oviraptorid um, eggs are arranged in like multiple rings that are stacked on top of each other. So they the nest forms kind of this volcano uh, shape, this volcanic pit kind of shape, uh, and with the eggs kind of embedded into its walls uh, and in these kind of um, uh, rings that are uh, layered on top of one on top of another. Like 
this is this is kind of weird, right? Because uh, if they're layered on top of each other, then how does the parent contact all of these eggs at the same time um, to be able to incubate them efficiently? And people have suggested that, well, maybe they couldn't, and so maybe they weren't actually incubating their eggs. Um, uh, maybe their nest architecture just did not allow it. Um, well, uh, when it comes to incubating partially buried eggs, it turns out that there actually are some modern birds that do this. There are a few species of uh, modern shorebirds that will partially incubate their eggs. Uh, nonetheless, they, have, they don't have any trouble being able to incubate their eggs, um, partly by using their own body heat, even though the eggs are partially buried. Um, so it clearly is possible. We've actually talked about a previous study um, uh, on the show, in one of our very earliest episodes, in fact, uh, where the, one of the same authors that, um, uh, of that previous study uh, also did this new study that I'm going to talk about. Um, and they basically tested experimentally whether or not a different group of feathered Cretaceous theropods called the Troodontids could um, incubate their eggs. And like Oviraptorids, the Troodontids had partially buried eggs in their nests. We know this because we have found fossil nests of Troodontids as well. Um, and the experimental results from that study showed that they could still incubate eggs, uh, even when they were partially buried in sediment. But the nest architecture of Troodontids and Oviraptorids um, is still kind of different, because in Oviraptorids, the eggs are kind of embedded in the sediment kind of vertically. So like one end of the nest, or one end of the egg, was like directly implanted into the sediment, and it kind of sticks vertically outward, upward. Um, and so you can kind of the dinosaur could directly sit on top of the eggs in this position, uh, and it wasn't like the kind of layered ring structure that the oviraptorids had. So the multi-layered nest architecture um, of oviraptorids is still very curious, isn't it? We don't see this in any modern birds, um, and it's different from the condition in the troodontids. It was suggested that uh, by the kind of opponents of the idea that oviraptorids uh, were incubating their, their eggs, uh, that, well, maybe these adults that were found on top of their nests were not incubating. Uh, like, again, one, one possibility is that they were just guarding the eggs, but another hypothesis was that, oh, well, maybe these were um, oviraptorids that had just finished laying eggs. Uh, it, is, it is hypothesized that, uh, like things like emus and cassowaries, multiple female oviraptorids came together to mate with one male and then uh, deposit their eggs in the same nest. Um, and this is suggested because the number of eggs in a single oviraptorid nest uh, seems too great to be laid by just one individual. And so it was suggested that, okay, so maybe like one female had finished laying her eggs and then uh, for some reason, you know, was killed or died on top of the nest, um, but were, were not actually going to be sticking around to incubate the nest afterward. Um, this idea was interesting uh, because it seemed that a lot of these uh, examples of oviraptorids being found on top of the nest were found on top of like smaller clutches than like a complete nest would be. Uh, but it has recently been basically uh, rejected as well because a recently described specimen has one of, a, one of these adults on top of a nest um, and the nest, well, the eggs also preserve embryos at a very late developmental stage, showing that clearly this adult was associated with the nest um, for a long period of time after laying the eggs. So, nope, like, they, they, this wasn't just um, a case of being present um, at a very early stage and then, and then they were going to leave afterward. Um, and in fact, some of the authors that described the specimen were some of the same authors that had uh, kind of questioned the idea of them incubating the eggs before. So, so they kind of kind of rejected their own idea in that in that case. Um, and to be honest, like that that idea was never that convincing to me because it's like it's a very circumstantial kind of thing for an adult to be found directly on top of a, a nest uh, uh, right after laying, laying the eggs uh, if they weren't going to be sticking around for a long time. Uh, and yet we have multiple examples of this. It's like, kind of, kind of uh, it just seems like less likely um, than the idea that they were kind of uh, spending a lot of time on top of the nest. Um, but uh, even even after all of this back and forth, um, it is still an open question. Like how how does this nest, nest architecture affect the ability of oviraptorids to incubate the eggs? And so this new study, we finally get to this new study, um, decided to do an experimental kind of approach, similar to what they did for troodontids in the past. And so what they did was they replicated the nest architecture of oviraptorids using unfertilized emu eggs, which are similar in, in um, size and possibly in color to actual oviraptorid eggs. 
Um, so they basically took unfertilized emu eggs, arranged them in the same way that an oviraptorid egg would be, uh, oviraptorid um, uh, eggs in an oviraptorid nest would be arranged based on fossil evidence. Um, and it, it is quite funny because in the acknowledgments on this paper, um, the uh, the author actually went the extra mile to thank the emu farm that prevent that uh, provided him with these eggs uh, because he was like you know getting a request for forty unfertilized emu eggs is probably not a, a request they get very often but they still did it so thank you very much for doing that um, that was kind of kind of an interesting aside um, but in any case uh, and then he got um, a bucket of water that was heated. Um, and uh, like, like put enough water in it to make it the same mass, the same body mass of an oviraptorid of an ov appropriate size, um, and heat it up to an appropriate body temperature, um, because people have estimated what kind of body temperature um, oviraptorids might have had uh, based on like chemical isotopes um, in the in the eggshell fossils, um, and so heat it up. Uh, to the same uh, body temperature that we think oviraptorids might have had, uh, made it the same size as an appropriately sized oviraptorid, and so he had this bucket of heated water as a surrogate dinosaur that he put on top of these eggs um, to see how well these eggs could be heated by this uh, by this dinosaur. Um, also, just to add, the bottom of the bucket was was cut out, um, and then instead it was replaced by the soft liner. So the water was still kept in, but it was a soft underside, so it, it, it could be like kind of spread out on top of the eggs instead of just like this hard uh, plastic bottom. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, being a better kind of a stand-in for what an actual dinosaur would, would be like. Um, and so, as it turns out, uh, quite interestingly, um, the eggs were warmed, uh, all the eggs were successfully warmed to average temperatures of 8 to 10 degrees uh, above ambient temperatures. And so that means that this surrogate dinosaur uh, was able to incubate all of these eggs in these different layers uh, efficiently, or at least uh, effectively. Um, and not only that, but the eggs in the bottom layer were actually the warmest, which was kind of contrary to what had been suggested before. People were saying, "Oh, well, the um, maybe the eggs on top could could uh, were the ones that could be incubated most efficiently uh, because they seemed to be closest to, to the dinosaur, right?" Um, but uh, it turns out that the eggs on the bottom um, could be incubated uh, to to higher temperatures than the rest. Um, uh, this also shows that the dinosaur didn't have to be in direct contact to all of the eggs at once to be able to incubate them. Because that, that was also suggested to be, to be a problem. Whereas, like, there, there are so many eggs arranged in all these layers. How do you touch all these eggs at once with just one dinosaur, right, uh, to, to incubate them? Um, but it turns out that just having the dinosaur on top of the nest uh, could create, like, this kind of mini environment, uh, this micro environment that was warmer than the rest of the ambient temperature. Um, uh, and therefore could potentially incubate these eggs. Um, and not only that, but the author also tried other experimental setups. So this was like the first experimental setup was just directly putting this bucket on top of these, these eggs. But he also considered the possibility, well, um, you know, these dinosaurs had legs <laughs> that would go down into the nest, right? Um, and so uh, what if like these were contributing to um, um, to egg incubation in a way that was not that could not be captured by the previous ex experimental setup, and so he added these pipes that came out of the bucket and would circulate water throughout um, uh, through them. Uh, then tried to see how this would affect the incubation of the eggs, and as it happens. Um, this gave even better results uh, in terms of egg um, incubation effectiveness because it turns out that the eggs were incubated to even warmer temperatures to between uh, 10 to uh, about 10 to 11 degrees above ambient temperatures when they had this kind of setup with the circulating water to uh, simulate the legs of the dinosaur um, and the eggs in the different layers could be warmed more evenly than they could uh, without the without the pipes and so this kind of addresses one of the main uh, objections to the idea that oviraptorids were incubating their eggs which was that they, they couldn't incubate the eggs evenly with each other with the different layers uh, but with the when the legs were considered it turns out that they might well have been able to um, so I think this is a really interesting study 
Um, and it also shows a, a few other things. Uh, first of all is that, yeah, it, it is possible that having these eggs partially buried uh, is not as efficient a way of, of incubating them as they would be if they were completely exposed and could be like completely surrounded by a parent. Um, but, you know, evolution does not work on like what makes something perfect, right? As long as something has an advantage um, in the in the par particular conditions that they're that they're living in, uh, that could well be selected for by natural selection. This setup uh, clearly um, is amenable to to like uh, contact incubation. Um, like clearly, they they can warm the eggs to higher temperatures than they would otherwise. Um, and not only that, but uh, in the particular environmental conditions that this was tested in, uh, took place in probably a cooler environment than most oviraptorids were living in. So perhaps in a warmer environment, like in the in most of the Cretaceous, uh, this would have been even more effective. Um, and so sometimes good enough is, is good enough for evolution. And so um, perhaps this incubation method was enough to provide them with an advantage to select for this kind of incubating behavior. Um, and there was actually a third setup that the author tried, which was like, what if the eggs were completely buried, which we don't think was the case with the Obiraptorid eggs, but, you know, just to see what would happen. It turns out that if the, even if the eggs were completely buried under sediment, um, there is potentially still a benefit to having a, you know, a parent sitting on top warming them, um, at, at least if they were buried at a relatively shallow depth. And so what this suggests is that there is like this potential pathway to uh, the evolution of these partially exposed eggs, um, where like it could have started out with the eggs completely buried, which we think was the ancestral dinosaur condition. Um, but perhaps in a, in a case where the eggs were not buried very deeply and had a parent sitting on top, uh, that could have provided a benefit to having this contact incubation, which would have paved the way to uh, having eggs that were more exposed. And then over time, you would get this completely exposed condition in modern birds. Um, and furthermore, this study also suggests possible benefits of this very weird architecture that the oviraptorid um, nests seem to, to come in. Namely, that if these eggs were laid out on a flat surface instead of this volca volcano-like pit, um, as shown in the figure here, this is actually what the figure is primarily trying to show, is that um, the volcano-like pit has a, uh, a greater surface area. So basically you can put more eggs into a nest like this um, than you could with a completely flat nest. Um, and so that allows the, an oviraptorid of a given size to be able to incubate more eggs than they would otherwise. So they could perhaps you know, mate with more females and get more eggs put into that nest. Um, Indeed, uh, this kind of volcanic pit kind of structure um, also would accommodate having the hind limbs extending downward into the pit uh, to incubate the nest. And as mentioned earlier, that would seem to incubate the nest even more efficiently than they would uh, if it was just like a flattened, um, kind of sitting directly on top of a flat uh, surface. Um, and so, uh, in my opinion, I think with this study, all of the criticisms that have been put forward against the idea that oviraptorids were incubating their eggs with their own body heat have been pretty satisfactorily addressed. And like obviously, you know, a, a bucket of water with lining on the bottom is not a perfect model for, for a dinosaur. But like, I think the experimental setup here gets pretty close to the kind of conditions that you would um, expect. Um, if oviraptorids were incubating their eggs, um, to be able to at least um, give us some reasonable conclusions about uh, whether or not this behavior was feasible. Um, and so, although kind of even more detailed modeling would be welcome in the future, uh, I, think, I think this provides very strong evidence um, for this kind of proposed behavior. Um, and indeed, something that's always been kind of unclear to me is that why is, is why the eggs would be exposed if there was no contact incubation. Because in just about every other way, if you expose the eggs without a parent present, it's, uh, it seems detrimental because they are more exposed to predators, they're more, more exposed to like fluctuations in the environmental temperature if they're partially exposed. Um, so um, that, that is something that I think the opponents of the incubation hypothesis 
never at least to to me um addressed in a satisfactory way like how how are they dealing with these problems and why would they evolve kind of partially buried eggs um if they weren't incubating them whereas if they were incubating them there's a very clear advantage to exposing the eggs because that exposes more you know more of the egg for a parent to incubate um so yeah, I, I I really I really like the study, um, and it, it definitely is a nice follow up to the Troodontid study that one of the same authors did did previously, um, and I, I think it's it's a really really nice step forward in terms of helping us understand the biology of these dinosaurs. Clearly, they were in some ways uh, reproducing similarly to modern birds, but in other ways, like the nest architecture, uh, is completely different. So this kind of experimental study to help us understand um, how extinct animals might have lived uh, is always uh, really fascinating to me. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, it certainly goes a long way into something that I've talked about here and there on the show, where we probably shouldn't expect to find exact analogs to animal behaviors between today and in the past. Exactly. But in the past, there's always going to be, I mean, there's almost certainly going to be like unique things that animals were doing that we just don't see today. Right. And so seeing this sort of like upside down volcano nest <laughs> of, of eggs for an over after it, like that checks out, right. I think. Um, also, I just, I mean, I know you had you had a little reservations about like the experimental like setup of this but i i mean i think it's incredibly brilliant how yeah. they thought to figure this out um because like i suppose like you could have done this maybe like through like a computer study right like, computer modeling to kind of do this but they decided to go practical mm -hmm. and, yeah. <laughs> and get eggs um and 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 kind of build this nest um gosh i'm almost curious cause i haven't read the paper do they have like photos of the setup in the paper? Uh, yes, they do. Um, and yeah, the, that bucket of water with <laughs> lining uh, does not look very much like a dinosaur. But uh, yeah, there, there there are pictures of it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Interesting that they chose a bucket. I would have figured maybe like a giant like like one of those heating pad things that you put mm, in the microwave. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that could have worked too. Um, but that is very interesting. Um, yeah, I know we had talked about this in private, but I had been hearing inklings of like over after it's sitting on the nests may not be a thing. And it always was confusing. And so to kind of see this paper kind of outlined and, and to have you explain the story behind, you know, that discourse, um, you know, it, it is reassuring to me from like a scientific perspective <laughs> because it, it takes me back to the horse paper that we talked about. Oh, yeah. Where the, the evolution of horse feet. And like how the hoof developed right how we thought that like like we were almost pretty sure that we had we knew exactly how this this organ arose you know like the the, the gradual loss of the of the digits to make the hoof and then here occur, come along some researchers who were like well maybe maybe we've been too quick to accept this are we mm. sure we've exhausted every possibility that right. that this could be something else um, and when they did the study, they basically found the, the same result that they had always argued. Um, and so it's, it's kind of nice to see that kind of repeated here with the over to kind of show like, you know, before so something that you could argue is almost textbook. Like we want to make absolutely sure that we, we've covered all of our bases. Mm -hmm. um, and so to kind of see like this same example here is just neat. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's a very appropriate example of how science should be done right and uh, i like to see that all the work has been displayed here and all of these criticisms have been addressed appropriately mm -hmm. um and so i'm definitely interested to see where this um will go because um, goodness knows like th those those over after fossils over the nests are are very beautiful things um hopefully maybe we'll find a specimen that shows a little bit more clearly like you know this is a brooding animal um, versus like maybe how like maybe you can find the uh, fossils of one in the process of of, of egg laying right because um, that would certainly help clarify things even more because that, that that's more direct evidence mm -hmm. like okay here's this animal um, over the nest um, it's very clearly brooding um, but I think this is a pretty good start now um, because I I just love the sort of experimental side of uh, of paleobiology like building 
mechanics from scratch, um, or even like using um, replicas of animals and animals mm -hmm. to kind of show how they lived. I I, I adore that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to see this here. Um, it was a great paper, buddy. <laughs> And so I guess on that note, uh, unless there's anything you wanted to add, um, we can move on to our final story here. Yeah, let's go ahead. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to shift things back to the invertebrate world here um, with this with this paper. Um, so uh, my second news story covers another group of organisms that, like, we have covered them, but not very extensively mm -hmm. on the show. Um, and that being the, the reef-forming corals. Um, now, of course, corals are animals. They are not plants. Um, specifically, they belong to a clade called Nidaria, uh, which also includes things like jellies and freshwater hydras, um, anemones. These are very ancient organisms that use special cells called nidocytes to gather food or defend themselves. Um, it's like, it, it looks like, okay, so picture a cell with like a little like garbage can lid <laughs> and coiled inside and shooting out is like a barbed kind of like wiry structure. Right. Um, so like that gives the jellyfish its characteristic sting. So all along its, um, its arms, uh, or I guess its tentacles, I should say, um, all along its tentacles are just rows and rows of these. And so... They detect, you know, potential prey or a threat, and these nidocytes all shoot out their barbs, mm -hmm. um, and that creates the burning sting that is so painful. Um, so corals have these too, um, but they use them to gather food. Uh, they don't necessarily like sting in the way that a jellyfish sting does. Um, but a, a sea anemone, that has a sting. Um, you, if you recall, like from Finding Nemo, for example. Um, the clownfish, uh, uh, the species of clownfish that live with anemones, they secrete a special mucus from their bodies. Mm -hmm. And this protects them from the anemone stings. So they can live inside the animal uh, with relatively good protection yep. mm -hmm. uh, from other prey animals that want to eat it. Because, they, of course, they will lack the, the, the coverings to protect them from the anemone stings. And they, they'll be in for a surprise if they try to catch the clownfish. <laughs> um, so uh, corals belong to a clade of nadarians called anthozoa, along with the sea anemones. Um, but corals um, are colonial animals. So they consist of microscopic polyps that actually look a little bit like tiny anemones. Um, and these link together. And over time, they form a hard skeleton of secreted calcium carbonate. And so you put enough of these together over time, and you have a coral reef with many different species that have different branching patterns or, or outward skeletons that they form. Uh, and these provide, of course, food and shelter to a myriad array of other marine organisms. Uh, they are quite literally the rainforests of the oceans. Mm -hmm. Now, reef corals are interesting in that they form a symbiotic relationship um, with a type of algae called uh, zoos and thalae. Now, uh, these are a type of dinoflagellate um, they live in the bodies of the coral polyps within very dense assemblages, and they give each coral species its own distinct vibrant colors. Uh, so there's many species within this particular type of, of algae. Uh, these dinoflagellates are photosynthetic, like plants, um, but rather than taking up carbon all for themselves, they feed it to the corals mm -hmm. and help them gain vital energy. Um, in exchange for the corals, of course, providing a safe residence for them uh, from microbial predators within the body. Uh, this is known as endosymbiosis. And uh, uh, many of our viewers who are into paleontology will know about this from way deep in the past, in Precambrian time, uh, the ancestors of eukaryotic life. So animals, plants, fungi, a myriad group of microbes like amoebas, um, those are eukaryotes. That is a cell that is formed from the fusion of an archaeal cell that ingested a bacterial cell. And the bacterial cell was kept alive inside the body of the other cell and eventually became the mitochondria, hmm. which provides energy to the cells. So that's an endosymbiotic event. So the, the fusion 
of these dinoflagellates within the coral animals. That's another example of this phenomenon. Uh, this study, which is by uh, Jorg Weidman and colleagues, has revealed a rather interesting aspect of this um, biology of corals. So it has been known for some time that the symbiotic relationship of corals with zoos and thylae does not promote the coral's overall growth and reproduction. For that, corals instead extract nitrogen and phosphorus from the foods they consume from the filter feeding that goes on with each individual polyp. Remember, the polyps are little anemones, so these mm. little tentacles are catching particles from the water, small animals, for example. Uh, and so another case of this close in, uh, symbiosis, the algae also extract some of the secreted products of the nitrogen and phosphorus intake, and they use it to aid in their development, which of course in turn helps in its duties as a symbiont to the coral. Um, but there's been some issue in understanding here. So based on previous studies, there seems to be a bit of a mismatch in the rate of coral growth and the intake of foods from the water, in that the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen consumed by corals, you know, by themselves, is technically not enough to match with how much they grow themselves. Hmm. So there must be another source of nutrients that the corals are using for them to grow at the rates that they do. Lo and behold, the authors of this study seem to have found the solution. It turns out that all of the remaining nitrogen and phosphorus that a coral should need to help with growth actually derives from the zooxanthellae themselves. In other words, the corals were eating their own symbionts. Oh, wow. <laughs> so here's how this works. Because the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus occurs in very small amounts in coral reefs themselves, those animals can access more amounts from deep water upwellings or from clouds of plankton that roll in from elsewhere, um, or from the products of migratory fishes and seabirds uh, through their waste uh, disposals. So as explained earlier, uh, these corals intake these elements through their body as they eat, but they lack the key enzymes to assimilate them into their bodies directly. But the algae, however, can do this. So in a way that doesn't exhaust their supplies, the coral polyps uh, will selectively digest some of their algae who had processed the nitrogen and phosphorus themselves so efficiently that the corals could then incorporate them into their bodies to grow and reproduce. And so in effect, you know, this action of the corals, you know, having these, having these symbiotic algae, taking some of them, but, you know, making sure that they don't take all of them to exhaust their supplies, mm. that means effectively that these corals are farming their symbionts, hmm. which is a weird thing to think about, um, you know, through their promotion, uh, through, through the promoting of their growth in that process. Um, when we think about farming, of course, we think that it's a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, anthropologists describe farming as, you know, you're taking plants and animals, rearing them, and then using their products or the bodies themselves for your own growth. Mm -hmm. um, with, with or without like domestication, the taking part as well. Um, but of course, we know of other organisms that do farm, like other animals, mm -hmm. like ants, for example, some species of ants will farm aphids. They will take the secretions that the aphids produce from their from their abdomens and use them as a source of food. Um, but they won't necessarily like eat all the aphids like other ants probably would. Um, and also there are ants that will like farm fungus. They will grow fungus um, in their colonies, for example, for their own uses. Mm -hmm. um, and so to see that like um, a much more ancient group of organisms with, uh, I guess that's not necessarily a bilaterian, in this case, a coral to do this sort of process <laughs> was a big surprise to find. Mm -hmm. um, so in the test to see just how effective this process of farming actually was, the authors set up an interesting experiment. They utilize saltwater tanks at the University of Southampton, and they grew 10 different coral species in different controlled conditions. So some of the tanks would have low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, while others would have higher amounts. And you can kind of see this in the illustrations here um, above, which is from the paper. This is showing two different species of corals. Um, 
And so over a period of more than 203 days, the team observed how the corals grew and measured their intake of nutrients accordingly through the use of isotopic spikes that could actually like track the movement of nitrogen atoms through the organisms. And it was found that the more nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, the more readily the symbiotic algae took them up and through their feedings, the more exponentially the corals grew up. Hmm. So the lower nutrient waters, um, in contrast, were so poor on the corals that after that they would have to go and like really farm their symbionts to make up for that kind of lost nutrients in the water. But after a while, they would uh, they would be under so much stress that they would expel their symbionts and they would die through coral bleaching. Mm. So you can see clearly um, in the tanks that were replete with nitrogen and phosphorus, the corals over time grew much more vibrant and dynamic. They retained colors. Uh, they had uh, more elaborate structures. But if you look at the limited um, tanks where the, there was less nutrients in the water, clearly these corals were doing very poorly. Yeah. Um, that's the sickly corals if I've ever seen them. Mm. Um, so the key to the understanding here, of course, is that the corals were actually farming the symbionts, um, was that even when the team would add extra food in the high density tanks, that they would add like more nitrogen and phosphorus or more sources uh, of food to create nitrogen and phosphorus, the corals could feed almost exclusively on their symbionts as a source of food, hmm. and they would still grow up very healthy. So in other words, the corals were really supplying themselves with their own food hmm. inside their bodies. Now, in the paper and accompanying press releases, it was noted that this paper seemed to play a key role um, in further solving what's known as Darwin's paradox. So on the famous voyage of the Beagle, Charles Darwin noted that corals flourished in seemingly nutrient barren waters, which was counter to what, was it, what, to what he expected. Mm. Um, so in recent years, researchers had cracked little bits of the puzzle here and there. Um, so like there was a publication um, in February of 2016 by uh, Jameson M. Grove and colleagues that showed how the growth of phytoplankton was particularly high in island reef environments because of a combination of upwellings of nutrients from deep waters and from the waste products of animals in or on the surface. And these conditions encourage coral reefs to form and thrive. And so thanks to the new information from this paper, we now have another piece of that puzzle and just how the corals are able to synthesize those nutrients in the first place if they were not known to be able to do so to begin with. Um, and in fact, this current research is actually supplemented by other studies um, including one that was done in the waters of the Indian Ocean. So they observed corals in the wild in real time um, and found that the corals that grew by seabird colonies, which produce a lot of guano, um, received more nutrients from that runoff than those without. And so thus they, grow, they grew faster and more vibrantly. And, you know, that has some very important implications. I mean, not just for aquarium enthusiasts. So if you happen to like growing live corals in your tanks and you want them to grow healthy, just you know, add more fish. Mm. Um, but like there were implications for ocean conservation as well. Right. Um, so for starters, anthropogenic sources of nutrient runoff, things like factory farms, those can provide too many nutrients for coral reefs to handle. And as well with the increasing impacts of anthropogenic climate change on deep world oceans, it is becoming harder and harder for corals to access deep water upwellings of nutrients as the increased heating of the oceans carves barriers into nutrients and prevents them from moving into the areas where the corals are actually living. And in a warming world, corals will need to rely more and more then on surface level sources of nutrients, such as those from fishes, seabirds, and other organisms that produce waste that includes nitrogen and phosphorus as a byproduct. So it would be vital then to maintain those communities of organisms if we want to ensure that coral reef ecosystems survive into the future. Because if coral animals become too stressed out by lack of nutrients and overheated waters, again, they will expel the algal symbionts and die off. And we now know that they'll 
lack a huge source of food in the process. So even if corals can hold on in nutrient-poor waters for a little bit longer by relying on their algae as a source of food, as sort of like a, a last-ditch resort, this is clearly not a long-term solution mm. for the survival of those organisms. We, we, we would really have to ensure that shallow water oceans remain biodiverse if we want to help corals in the future. And so you know, this was a piece of research that I was certainly not expecting. Um, and it kind of had like an interesting effect on my, you know, on, on like the way that I was thinking about it. Because mm. when you would read like the press releases, like they would just open up with like, oh, corals farm their algae. Um, but like to clearly see like the science behind it and what that exactly means, um, it's far more interesting to me mm -hmm. than just the notion that they're, that they're farming. Like, you know, this is, this is a solution that this ancient group of, of animals has found, goodness knows how long into the distant past, um, to be able to maximize their, their livelihoods in waters that are generally nutrient poor. Mm -hmm. And that's remarkable ingenuity for something that, you know, is technically seen as like background fodder for more <laughs> interesting animals, right? Um, but no, the corals themselves are just as fascinating, if not more so in this mm -hmm. case. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this paper. Um, I'd love to hear your comments on it. <laughs> yeah, this is a really fascinating discovery. And coral are really interesting animals. I mean, I mean just, just the fact that most people probably wouldn't even realize that they're animals, uh, or at least plenty of people probably don't. Um, kind of tells you something about how remarkable they are. Um, and this study definitely adds a lot to that, I think. Um, yeah, I, I remember seeing the press releases for, for this study too. And right away, it was like, wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's quite a finding. And it's, it's always interesting to see um, these kinds of studies about uh, interactions between different types of organisms because that, that's obviously something that's very uh, central to coral biology is uh, the interactions that they have with um, their symbionts and also with kind of animals that live in and around them. Um, and of course, ecology is, is central to the biology of all types of organisms, but uh, there are clearly some very intricate and uh, distinct uh, links here when it comes to corals. Um, so it's always very cool to get a, get a better perspective on that. And it, it, it also shows off something quite nicely about how uh, mutualisms um, are, are not always like a very straightforward kind of, uh, yeah, they, they, they live together and they both benefit kind of, kind of thing, right? Um, so obviously, yes, uh, both both the corals and their symbionts do benefit from, from this arrangement, but the corals also eat some of their symbionts um, as found as, as founded by the study. Um, so uh, it, it is interesting how these different um, kind of types of interactions can, can coexist and still form an ultimately uh, mutually beneficial overall kind of arrangement. Um, so that, that is, that is definitely very fascinating. Um, I guess the last thing I'll mention uh, about this is that um, in case any of our listeners uh, is not aware of the channel Z Frank, um, you should definitely go check that out. Uh, it is a science communication channel, uh, but has a very interesting presentation style. Um, and uh, to be honest, it's kind of difficult to describe what that style is like. Um, but it's basically a narrator talking over a footage of various kinds of organisms doing their thing. Um, and, uh, but, but not in a very kind of documentary type uh, narrative, um, but often in a very informal and sometimes a crass kind of manner. However, it is very, very entertaining and humorous. Um, and it is genuinely very informative. And the reason I bring it up is that the most recent uh, video on the channel as of the time of recording is actually about corals. Um, so from my, what I recall, I think this study might have been a bit too recent to, to make it into to that video, but it does cover many other aspects of coral biology that are just as interesting. Um, so if you want to learn more about the lives, lives of coral, I think that, that's a great video to, to check out, um, and I'll definitely link it in the description below. And I'll, I'll say that Z Frank's videos are, are not just informative, but like 
they are produced um, in consultation with relevant experts and researchers who study like the animals that are discussed in these videos. And not only that, but they often cover very um, obscure types of animals. Uh, Z Frank has, has done a video on corals, and he's done all kinds of very interesting uh, videos about uh, organisms that don't get a lot of spotlight. Um, and so despite the fact that the presentation style can be very uh, irreverent, <laughs> it, it, is, it is very obvious that the creators um, uh, were, it's, it's mostly one person, I, I believe, so it's very obvious that Z Frank himself is, um, uh, is very fascinated by the natural world and has a great respect for the scientists who study it. So um, I, I think it is, it is an excellent channel <laughs> to, to check out uh, if you, you don't mind the occasionally like <laughs> a crass humor. Um, so it, yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a great study um, and corals are very interesting. And I, I think it's great that there are um, so many efforts now by researchers and conservationists to try and figure out um, the, the best ways to conserve them. Um, and every every time we learn more about their biology, that's definitely a big help in that uh, direction. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'll definitely echo what you said about Z Frank. Um, one thing that's really become apparent to me is the growth of that channel in terms of content. Because I remember when Z Frank was just starting out um, many hot years ago. And uh, yeah, the, the, the presentation style and the seriousness in terms of like presenting the information was very different between then and now. Um, like, uh, yeah, the, the crass humor is definitely something that would probably need to be navigated depending on who you are. Um, I know, uh, like I know that that's really kind of how the channel was looking like it was going to go when it was starting out mm -hmm. because they had, yeah, was it true facts about the duck? which was just an excuse to make jokes about duck penis. <laughs> um, whereas now, again, you're having, you're having these videos where he's consulting researchers. He's including a lot of like recent studies and like, like graphics from papers yes. to help illustrate his points right. um, with far more quality wildlife footage as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually like relevant to what he's talking about. Um, huge difference from those older stuff. And, 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 Again, like all the science, all the science checks out, um, while still keeping like that kind of comedic, crass side to it. Um, like I know, like I've shared some of those videos with my folks, um, and they've learned a lot from it, and they appreciate the presentation style. Um, my dad has chuckled more than once <laughs> watching some of these, while also being like, "That's really neat." Wow. <laughs> um, and and so like that's, man, you want to talk about great like science outreach. Um, yeah, definitely. Again, I'll, I'll back you up on that. Z Frank, um, check him out for sure. We will, we will link in the description. Um, but yeah, definitely. I, I think I, I appreciate when there are studies like this that make an effort towards conservation. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, listen, like we're not, we're not just learning about these organisms to increase our understanding of these groups. Like, we want to we want to help these organisms like have a future. And we want to help people appreciate them more and more. So by using this research and then applying it to like the work that conservationists are doing to kind of like give a helping hand, like, hey, by the way, corals do this really neat thing with their biology. Like, you know, their symbionts, they're using them more, more complex in more complex ways than we imagine. And this could be good to help us like make a case for preserving wild areas and promoting biodiversity in regions, um, like protecting seabird colonies, for example. Like, you would think, like, what, do, what do birds have to do with coral? Well, clearly, coral grow very well by nesting seabirds, so you, you want to protect the seabirds so you can protect the corals. Mm -hmm. um, and it all just kind of flows together, and um, I really appreciate that. Um, it, I mean, it really shows that, like, the researchers behind this paper have their hearts in the right place. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, they're interested in these animals not just from like a, a basic scientific standpoint, um, like they, they want to encourage their survival. Uh, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, so definitely big kudos to uh, your Waterman colleagues because um, uh, this was an outstanding paper. I really appreciated it. Um, but with that, my friends, that is the end of our news episode today. Mm -hmm. um, a very great selection of stories that we talked about. I really liked uh, 
And there were a lot of choices to choose from, for sure. Um, as we always say, mm. so we, we could have easily uh, included more stories. But alas, we must move on. Yeah. Mm. So if we move to the next slide now, we will end with our usual end matter. Um, so of course, we are on Patreon if you wish to support us in any way. Um, that is patreon.com forward slash time and clades, where any monetary donations will help us continue the series and develop new projects and expansions. Um, we've been very fortunate to have a number of patrons already. Uh, in fact, all of them are of a tier where they are owed shout outs. So we want to give a big thanks to my sister, Julie, and our friends, Paul, Denver, Frankish, and Val de Nunzio. And we want to give a big special welcome to another one of our friends who has joined on very recently, uh, our friend Tristan. So thank you all so much for helping us. It means a lot. Um, and of course, if you want to get early access to topics we're going to talk about on the show, if you want to contribute questions that could be addressed on the show, even suggest topics, um, Patreon might be something to look forward to. So um, again, that's patreon.com forward slash time clades. Um, of course, other acknowledgments as well. We want to thank our good friends, Henry and Alicia, for their contributions to the series. Um, Henry, of course, is responsible for the wonderful theme music that opens up each episode. And Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Alvarosaur avatar. He's a cheerful little fellow. Um, and of course, we are on Twitter <laughs> um, still. Um, that is at Time and Clades, where we usually release our episodes when they're um, published. But most likely you are following us and watching on our YouTube page through Time and Clay. So if you want to like and subscribe, that's always appreciated. Um, now, I know I just talked about Patreon as a source of like sending us questions, but we are also accepting questions from our email, timeandclades at gmail.com, as well as, you know, you can send us tweets for our various announcements. Any questions that you might have, whether about the topics that we've covered on this episode or just anything in general, we will certainly get to them. Um, and if you want to read any of these papers or follow any of the links that we've mentioned, for example, if you want to check out Paleo Edits or Z Frank, um, you can go to the description for links to those and other references for this episode. Um, we try to be as concise as possible. Um, so anything that we talk about, like go check this out, we will make sure that it's there so we can further anyone's interest in natural history topics. Um, but with that, that is the end of our episode. We want to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, in terms of things to look forward to in the future, yes, I am still working on the update special for Humanity <laughs> Prologue. Um, I, I, I don't mean to George R. R. Martin, you guys, but it is coming. It is coming. Um, but uh, certainly um, there will be other news episodes, uh, especially for September, that you will get to look forward to. So we hope you'll stick around, and we always appreciate you alls support. And we hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs> Take care, everybody.